And without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. Uh, and before we begin, Secretary Ramondo has informed us that she has only two hours available for this hearing. So in the interest of time, Ranking Member Loftgren and I are limiting ourselves to very brief opening statements, and we're asking the Secretary to do the same. Additionally, to give as many members as possible a chance to ask questions, and in, the, uh, and in concurrence with Ranking Member, I ask unanimous consent to limit each member's uh, Q&A to four minutes without objection. So ordered. I would also like to request unanimous consent to submit two statements for the record. The first is from Chairman Lucas, who could not be with us here today. As you know, uh, he has had a terrible accident with a bull. He's a rancher, and uh, he is recuperating. Uh, we look forward to his return soon and to his leaders, because his leadership is dearly missed. Uh, the second is a full opening statement for myself. Without objection, we will enter that. So I'll recognize myself for one minute for an opening statement uh, so I would say welcome to the Science, Space, and Technology Committee's first oversight hearing on the CHIPS for America program. Secretary Ramundo, is, uh, we appreciate your willingness uh, to testify today. Thank you for being here. I understand you were in traffic. To, I'm sorry to hear that. That's not a, not a rare occurrence. Uh, uh, but your last minute uh, notice that you were only able to dedicate two hours of your time to discussing a $50 billion program is frustrating, to say the least, to the members of this committee uh, who have a responsibility to oversee your use of these taxpayer dollars and ensure that the program uh, is a success. I hope that you will at least commit to meeting in person with any members of this committee, whether Republican or Democrat, who are not able to ask the questions that they prepared for uh, this hearing. And I hope that despite our time constraints that we'll be able to have a productive discussion today. Congress funded the CHIPS program to bolster national security and to ensure that semiconductors can be produced here in the United States in a cost competitive way. But the policies advanced by this administration during implementation have been criticized for driving up the cost of doing business. So I expect that to be uh, a, a strong topic of discussion today along with guardrails to protect our investments from benefiting our adversaries. I look forward to the dialogue uh, that we will have today and I look forward to hearing more about the near-term future of the CHIPS program directly from the Secretary. So thank you, Secretary Ramundo, for taking the time uh, to join us today. So and I would like to now recognize the ranking member, gentlewoman from California, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and like you, I ask unanimous consent that my full statement be made part of the record. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just say that uh, Chips for America represents really a historic investment in reshoring our semiconductor manufacturing and innovation capacity. However, there are challenges in carrying out such an ambitious program. Uh, one of the concerns I have, which I've mentioned to the Secretary, is what steps the CHIPS program is taking to ensure that companies receiving funding implement the very highest standards for the handling of toxic chemicals. Uh, I come from Silicon Valley, where we've seen firsthand the tremendous benefits of the sem semiconductor industry, but also a problematic environmental legacy of some chip production. So we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to revitalize the U.S. semiconductor industry, but we also have an opportunity to do it in a way that protects American workers. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, now recognize, uh, thank you, Ms. Lofton. I recognize uh, the Secretary uh, for her testimony uh, for four minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you and good morning. I a uh, few things. One, I'm delighted to be here. Secondly, I spoke with the chairman yesterday and reassured him that I'm happy to spend any amount of time with any of you on any topic. Also, after speaking with you yesterday, we shifted the schedule a bit, so we'll be able to be here for at least two and a half hours. Um, I just want to thank you for this chance to update you on uh, the Chips and Science Act as outlined in detail in my written testimony. We've made significant progress since about a year ago when the bill was passed. Um, as evidence of that, 
for CHIPS, we've received more than 500 statements of interest from companies who want to participate and about 100 applications for the incentive program. So we are on track to launch the National Semiconductor Technology Center this fall, uh, which I know many of you will want to talk about. At EDA, we've launched two initiatives, the Tech Hubs Initiative and the Recompete Program. We're working as quick as we can to have announcements on both of those programs this fall. I will tell you both of these programs are massively oversubscribed. In addition, NTIA, NIST, and NOAA are working to implement additional provisions. Happy to talk about any of that. I just want to uh, reiterate what you all know and what the chair and ranking member have said. In addition, uh, if, if successful in implementing CHIPS and science, which is, uh, as the ranking member said, unprecedented and historic, the U.S. will become the premier dis destination in the world for where we design new chip architectures, do research and development in our research labs, make chips for every end use, manufacture chips at scale with American workers in the United States, and package the most sophisticated chips in the world all here on our shores. That's the vision that we're trying to achieve with your support. And you know, with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, I want to thank the Secretary for her testimony. Now, now the Chair would recognize himself for four minutes. Um, Secretary Raimondo, during negotiations of the Chips and Science Act, Science Committee Republicans developed strong guardrails that prohibit any company that accepts a grant incentive from expanding or building new advanced semiconductor manufacturing facilities in a country of concern, including China, uh, for 10 years. The language also gives the authority to you, uh, Madam Secretary, to recover any incentives received uh, should a company be found in violation of this. Can you please provide a short update on when the Department of Commerce's rule for implementing the guardrails will be finalized so that we can review it, considering the public comment period ended in May? Yes, thank you for your question. Um, so the answer is, is very, very soon. Uh, in a matter of weeks, that will be completed. Uh, you know, I'm trying to move as fast as I possibly can, but more important than going fast, I need to, we need to get it right, especially with respect to these guardrails. The whole purpose of the CHIPS program is national security, and so we have to be absolutely vigilant that not a penny of this helps China to get ahead of us, and that none of these companies who receive our money uh, do any research with China or investment in China that in any way undermines our own national security. So. Very soon it'll be out, and you know, look forward to working with all of you to implement this program to achieve its goals. Okay. The Chips and Science Act requires guardrails to be a part of any agreement or contract the department enters as part of a $39 billion taxpayer-backed chips incentive program. How is it then that the department has been accepting applications for the incentives program since March without the guardrails being finalized? And how is the department making it clear what commitments that applicants will be required to make when applying for the program if this rule has not been finalized? It makes no sense. Yeah. So we, so as you can imagine, these are incredibly complicated applications. We're requiring a huge amount of information from these companies. We obviously aren't going to make any commitments to any companies. Uh, and certainly not give any money to any companies until the guardrails are firmly in place. But if we were to, we're trying to parallel process so we can move fast. So we thought it was prudent to start, you know, seeking information so that companies could get into a good position to apply while finalizing the guardrails. But obviously, no commitments will be made to any company okay. until the guardrails are in place. All right. Can you commit that no application will be approved or money sent out the door until the guardrails are finalized? Yes or no? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. Second, the department is standing up tracks to provide space situational awareness data. Isn't this reinventing the already existing uh, system at the Pentagon? Very briefly. No. No. 
We're working on, like you say, space situational awareness with the Pentagon, with an interagency, uh, to track the commercial satellites and, 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 and commercial space traffic. It's more, more congested in space. We have to prevent um, collisions and the like. So no, it's an interagency process, and I think it's necessary. Okay. All right. Uh, the Chips and Science Act forbids companies from using CHIPS funds for stock buybacks. The CHIPS Act notice of funding opportunity, however, goes further. It asks applicants whether they plan to engage in any stock buybacks over the next five years and states that commerce will, quote, evaluate applications based on the extent of the applicant's commitments to refrain from stock buybacks, unquote. Does that mean that commerce will deny funding for applicants who plan to engage in any stock buybacks? And if not, then how should companies who engage in stock buyback in the normal course, what would they think about this provision? No, is the answer to your question. If you do buybacks, you are still eligible to receive the money. But look, as you know, the whole point of this program is for companies to invest in research and development, manufacturing in the United States. And so we're going to be tough on companies. Like, we want to see how, what are their investment plans? What are their research and development plans? They should be putting their money into investing in America and research and development in America so we protect taxpayer money. We can't be giving them money so they can go give it to their shareholders to make more money. This is money to, to race ahead for investments in semiconductor industry in our country. So it's not a prohibition, but it is a signal to industry that we are serious that this is not about padding their bottom line. This is about enhancing their ability to innovate in America. Well, I have one more question, but I'm out of time about uh, fluoral technology and PFOS, but I will submit that for the record. And so at this time, I would like to recognize the ranking member from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam Secretary. It's great to see you here, and I appreciated the time to talk to you earlier um, about uh, health and safety for workers in the uh, chip industry. As I mentioned in my uh, opening statement, um, Silicon uh, Valley has been the home of chip manufacturing for many years. It's a wonderful opportunity. It's helped build the valley. On the other hand, there has sometimes been a downside. Uh, multiple studies in the 1980s and 90s found that women working at microelectronics manufacturing sites had miscarriages at twice uh, the expected rate. and. Um, mm. uh, Although the industry has made significant strides in terms of the use of hazardous uh, chemicals, in some cases there is no alternative for uh, a, a hazardous chemical in the manufacturing. And, and in that case, uh, special care must be made uh, to pr prevent exposure uh, to the workforce. I'll just note that uh, this is from uh, an OSHA missive, uh, and I'll read it. OSHA's mandatory PELs uh, remain in effect. However, OSHA recommends that employers consider using the alternative occupational exposure limits because the agency believes that exposures above some of these alternative exposure, occupational exposure limits may be hazardous to workers even when the exposure levels are in compliance with OSHA standards. And in fact, it's the EPA standards in those cases that need to be uh, applied. I'll just say this, I appreciate your willingness to work with me on this. I look forward to vigorously engaging with you to see how we can get the great benefit of the CHIPS Act, but also protect our workforce. Let me ask another question. There's a company in California, not in my district, with an important question uh, that has broad policy implications. This company never offshored. Uh, and so as a consequence, their costs were higher because labor costs are higher in the United States. They are worried that they might be at a disadvantage in the selection process because of their higher cost structure. What's the department's general view on using the loan program to use US-only semiconductor manufacturers to refinance existing debt if it results in additional capital investments in the United States, what's the view on using the loan program to allow US-only semiconductor 
manufacturers to use loans for purposes of funding operational and workforce development costs? Mm -hmm. And is there concern about the higher cost structure disadvantaging them in the competition uh, accurate? Yeah. So a couple reactions, uh, mindful of time. On your first point, I, I am totally committed to working with you like we talked about. These are necessary. These companies use a lot of chemicals. Necessarily, it's heavily chemical-based. And as you say, sometimes OSHA isn't enough. So let's figure out better ways to work with companies to, to Absolutely. secure health and safety. Secondly, uh, the answer is yes. We look, we look well upon using loan authority and grant authority to help small companies, U.S.-based companies, to... Um, you know, defray the additional cost associated with the cost of U.S. labor. I would say, in a way, that's the point of this whole program. I mean, the truth of it is, you come from Silicon Valley, that's where all semiconductors once were, mm -hmm. and then it was in search of cheap labor <coughs> that these companies all went to Taiwan, China, Malaysia, et cetera. That's the point of this subsidy, to allow American companies and American workers, you know, stay in this business accounting for the fact that it is more expensive. So I'd say we're going to look. I have assembled an amazingly talented team. There was a piece in the Wall Street Journal about it a few months ago. I'd welcome any of you to come over to the department to meet this team. We have some top-notch investment people, a top-notch loan expert. We're going to be as creative as possible to stretch the money as much as we can to help American businesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired, and I yield back. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just <clears throat> slightly off that topic uh, regarding NOAA's misguided East Coast vessel speed rule regarding the North Atlantic right whales. You know, we had heard from NOAA that one or less whales on average per year have been killed by boats. I, and I'm wondering why the administration would move forward with releasing the proposed rule uh, later this year, and then next year, uh, hold a workshop on how technology can help protect the whales. It seems like they're putting the, heart, the cart before the horse. So w one thing I've learned since being Commerce Secretary is that the most complicated issues aren't semiconductor technology, it's the fish issues. <laughs> and I would be very happy, coming from the Ocean State myself, to come back to you on that, sir and give you, you know, a proper answer, and I'll have Dr. Spinrad, who runs NOAA, get in touch with you. But I will say this. I am personally sympathetic to both sides. We have to, you know, preserve the environment and protect the whales, but also I know a lot of people make a living as fishermen, and so let me come back to you with a better answer. Yeah. As a former governor, I wouldn't expect that you would like the way they rule, that rule out, and so I appreciate that answer. Yeah, it's complicated. They're often subject to lawsuits. Um, so permit me to come back to you. I'll do that. <clears throat> what specific uh, steps is the Department of Commerce taking to protect American interests at standard bodies where China has flooded them with high rates of participants yeah. and submissions? I worry a lot about this. Uh, we have a whole working group inside of Commerce at uh, NIST just focused on showing up at standards bodies. And exactly what you say. It sounds, you know, not sexy and boring, except when the Chinese write the standards to favor them, then we get locked out. And so I have put a huge priority on reinvigorating our presence at standard-setting bodies uh, all over the world. One little example I'll give you is we were successful in getting the American uh, chairperson of the ITU, the Telecommunications Union, because the Russians were backing an alternative, and we won, and that's because we focused on it and put a campaign in place, because you know standards really matter. Well, you just answered my next three questions, so uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Posey. You. And now I'd like to uh, recognize Ms. Bonamici from Oregon. Thank you to the chair. Thank you to the, to the ranking member. Thank you, Madam Secretary. It's good to see you. The Chips and Science Act is making historic investments in U.S. semiconductor manufacturing, in supply chain improvements, and in cutting edge research and development. Now, the ranking member said she represents the Silicon Valley. I represent Silicon Forest. And as a representative of the Silicon Forest, I'm excited for the opportunities. And I, it was a pleasure to host you in Oregon, Madam Secretary, where we heard from students at Portland Community College and learned, learned how they are preparing to 
enter the workforce. PCC has a pro program called Quick Start uh, in which they partner with the semiconductor leaders, uh, like Intel, for example, to provide skills-based tr skills training for the next generation of the semiconductor workforce. So, Madam Secretary, we need more pathways for people to enter the growing semiconductor and advanced manufacturing industries. So what workforce education programs is the department investing in to meet the R&D goals of CHIPS? And how can Congress and the department make these programs accessible to more diverse learners, including rural and underserved communities? Yeah. So great question. And I love visiting. Um, we had a great visit, and I was blown away by what I saw at the community college. I should tell you, if you were to say to me what keeps you up at night, it's a long list, but the workforce is something that we that I, I worry about. Right now, there's about 100,000, uh, there's a need for industry to have 100,000 semiconductor technicians. And that number is going to go up to about 300,000 pretty quickly. Technicians don't need a four-year college degree. The community college is a perfect training ground, maybe a high school plus a credentialing program. So we're doing a few things. As you know, we're going to stand up the NSTC that will have a whole workforce component. We encourage universities and community colleges to hook into that. And for every CHIPS applicant, every company that applies, we're requiring them to give us a workforce plan so what are you going to do? We're asking states. I'm calling governors myself and convening governors to say, invest your state money into workforce programs, including community colleges. The NSF has a couple hundred million dollars. So anyway, long story short, every single thing we're doing, whether it's the CHIPS money or the R&D money or outreach, it's to try to get states to put skin in the game so we can do this. I'll tell you some good news. We already have over 50 community colleges that we know of that have put out new training programs related to the semiconductor industry. That's exciting. So we just got to keep and I don't going. want to cut you off, but I want yeah, to get yeah, another ahead, question sorry. in. So That's a to, topic for a prepared and diverse workforce ready to implement the act, there, there must be access to high quality, affordable childcare. Yes. And I'm hearing this across Northwest Oregon and across the country. Under your leadership, the department is pioneering the requirement that uh, CHIP applicants must or should, depending on the size of the award, provide childcare for their workers, and I appreciate this commitment because of the serious challenges in the care economy. So, Madam Secretary, what criteria will the department use to evaluate the accessibility and quality of these child care services, and how will the department encourage applicants to partner with a diverse range of, of providers like Early Head Start or home-based child care services? Yeah. So, we're asking every company to show us their workforce plan, including a child care plan. There's no one-size-fits-all. It'll be different in every state, but it's exactly what you say. You can't, you can't hire the workers you need unless women can work, and that's not going to happen unless there's child care that's affordable. I'm not doing that because it's a social issue. It's a business issue. You talk to any Absolutely. CEO, and they tell you the same thing. Absolutely. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, as I yield back, I request unanimous consent to enter into the record a brief from the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment at UC Berkeley on implementing the CHIPS child care requirement and supporting good paying early childhood education jobs. And also, Mr. Chairman and, and colleagues, this is a good investment in our future to invest in our children. They will be the next generation of semiconductor workforce, and I yield back. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, I would now like to introduce, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 Mr. Garcia, our gentle, the gentleman from California, for four minutes. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chair uh, and uh, Madam Secretary. Good to see you again. Thanks for coming in. Uh, I respect and I, I agree with your comments. I think the biggest threat to the CHIPS Act is the workforce uh, right now. If we can't figure out how to get that right, so applaud the efforts. We need all hands on deck, uh, all, all, uh, all, all demographics, uh, both sexes and uh, everyone to max participate to support this. Uh, I want to thank you again for taking the time before the CHIPS uh, was uh, brought to the floor for a vote to help me get comfortable with uh, the requirements, uh, the, the diligence that you're putting into making sure uh, Mr. Chair, we spent uh, several hours in the SCIF uh, with, with uh, the Secretary's team as well as some uh, uh, corporate uh, uh, subject matter experts to make sure that we're porting over the requirements list to the DOD applications because it's, it's, it would be a terrible thing to build semiconductor chips for refrigerators and cars only to find out that we have no industrial base to service the hypersonics, the exotic weapons that we need in a fight against China. 
Uh, so I'd like you to, for you to touch on that, Madam Secretary. And I also want to um, thank you. Uh, we, we are getting actually very positive feedback from local industry partners in my district in Southern California from your team. The engagements that you've had uh, that you described have been fruitful. And uh, I think uh, I know it's early, but uh, the, the, the feedback is, uh, is very positive. So I appreciate the execution on that. Uh, and then last, before I hand it to you, just in the interest of time, uh, we had talked about uh, over the phone a couple of months ago um, supporting you with uh, an initiative, uh, this, this, this trade fight that we're in with China, this, this macro issue that we have with China being the biggest threat to the United States right now as a pure adversary. We, we have to figure out how to get to some sort of reciprocal trade agreement. I, I think you and I share that opinion. Uh, I just want to reiterate that I'm at your disposal. I am happy to pull together a bipartisan group of folks. And I know, you know, folks like Mike Gallagher on the, on the China Select Committee, uh, both sides of the aisle to come together to, to help enable you in that process. It's a, it's a long-term, you know, problem, I know, and, and the answers aren't easy, but I think it's important that we do get together uh, and start bending the arc towards a reciprocal trade agreement. China is doing to us uh, right now, uh, things that, that we should not tolerate. Um, but if we're going to allow them to do it, we should at least be able to do it to them and have access to their markets, their intellectual property. The agreement should be fair and balanced and reciprocal. And, and I think you understand and appreciate that. The last thing, uh, so, so if you can talk to the requirements, and then I also want you to add, uh, just touch on briefly uh, your level of satisfaction. I know it's not related to chips. But are you, are you okay with the way Treasury right now is currently um, managing and making sure that we are enforcing the sanctions against Russia uh, relative to the Ukraine conflict? Uh, if you can touch on those two things. Thank you. Okay. Um, for, good morning. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Uh, on the defense industrial base, one, I guess, update, I think, since the last time I saw you is that we've executed an MOU with the Defense Department to share information and work together on exactly this issue. So we get from DOD what are the defense industrial base chips needs to make sure that, you know, as you say, what we are incentivizing fulfills those needs. So I, f I feel good about that. It's progress and we're working very closely with the DOD and the intelligence community. That's great. So that's a good update. Reciprocity to China, I'm gonna come sit with you because I only have a minute now. I'll just say when I was in China, I was very clear that, you know, Alipay and Union Pay do business in the United States, Visa and MasterCard cannot. Their autonomous vehicle companies are piloting on our roads right now, we cannot. Their media companies every day are submitting content in the United States, we cannot. Right. It's a long list, it's not fair, enough is enough, let's level the playing field. And so I think there's a lot I'll come visit with you after okay. my trip, and Appreciate maybe it. we could talk about it. Um, on Russia, uh, you know, that it, Secretary Yellen and the whole team, I think, is doing a fantastic job under great, really difficult circumstances. The thing I'm focused on is the export controls. It's a, I'll be honest, it is a brutal day-to-day -day fight. Every time we find out that they're going around our export controls, we come down on them. But it's a, it is it's a it's a little like a whack-a-mole. Russia has been putting these net global networks together for decades. They're they're good at getting around us, and and I'd like to think we're even better about stopping it. So my point of it is, mm -hmm. it's vigilance. You got to take it take it to it every day with vigilance, and that's what we're doing with the export controls. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay, now I'd like to recognize uh, Ms. Stevens from Michigan. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's so nice to see you, Madam Secretary. And as I was thinking about uh, today's hearing, I was reflecting on the incredible workforce at the Department of Commerce. And I know that you have uh, been busy setting up a, a team, the CHIPS team, CHIPS for America team, uh, within the department itself and at NIST, and it's just a remarkable set of people who are implementing a very historic endeavor, and I'm going to take you up on your offer to come by and sit down with the investment crew and, and some of the other folks that are working on the initiative. But I, I did just want to ask you a couple of questions. Um, one is about open source central processing units, the CPUs, as as you know, anyone in the world can contribute instructions to the design of open source CPUs. 
which uh, then can be used for electronic pro uh, products. And currently there aren't requirements or regulations to ensure that open source CPUs have not had any instructions added by actors like China and Russia. I know uh, Mr. Garcia was just talking to you about export controls. So if you have any reflections on open source CPUs, in addition to what you just shared about uh, export controls, we are all ears. Um, also, we saw that the CCP came down um, with some restrictions on gallium and ger germanium. Um, gallium is used in the microelectronic components of many electronics, um, and germanium um, poses many uh, military applications critical to our national defense. And so, given these developments, what industrial policy initiatives has the department considered? maybe a chips-like initiative for rare minerals that you could implement if we want to draft a, a, another kind of chips 2.0 type of legislation uh, surrounding um, germanium in particular, given how critical that's going to be to, um, you know, to the chips implementation. And then lastly, if you have any other comments around the chips office and uh, the R&D facilities that the commercial opportunities for R&D facilities that you're going to put forward. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So on the gallium and germanium, you know that seems clear to me. To that's their tit for tat sort of retaliation, mm -hmm. and I think you know we're not going to be scared by that. We need to do what we're going to do to protect our national security. Period. And we have allies around the world who can provide some of those critical minerals to us, or as you say, we, you know, we can innovate here. Uh, I, would, I would welcome the opportunity to work with you or everybody to sit down and, and make a, a plan around critical minerals. You know, what are the most important critical minerals for products we need for our national security like chips? And if we can't you know, mine them or process them in our own country, then where else besides China and the world can we? Because we can't be held hostage, and so I would welcome that. Great. Um, the CHIPS team, as I mean, I've been in government now as an executive for more than a dozen years. This CHIPS team is like nothing I've ever I know, it's cool. created. It's over 100 people, uh, really top talent, working seven days a week. I'm very proud of them. It's a hard job, so we'll welcome your engagement. Um, on the research and development, uh, this fall, we're going to, you're going to, I would say in general, this fall, we will have big announcements on tech hubs, recompete, NSTC, R&D. You know, we, the bill passed a year ago. We've been working like crazy. In the next few months, you're going to see announcements on all of that. And we want to work with, you know, whoever in Michigan or any of your states, um, nonprofit, for profit, that we think can add to the innovation ecosystem. Great, thank you. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Fleischman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for appearing before us today. I have two questions. The first is on the RAN, the Radio Access Network. The Chips and Science Act contained funding for grants that could help increase supplier diversity in the wireless industry by supporting open radio access networks, uh, the RAN. Can you give us your thoughts on the program on how these funds can help scale new commercial ready open RAN vendors? And what is, what is at stake if these funds aren't quickly deployed to help spur the development and deployment of open RAN wireless networks? Yeah, thank you for the question. So as you say, there's a billion and a half dollars in the CHIPS Act for ORAN. I would say I think it's vitally critically important because we need secure 5G and 6G networks and you know to protect ourselves. And one way to do that, to bring down the cost, is to have them be open. So we put out the first money in August of this year we put out uh, $5.5 million for the first awards. We're going to put more money out later this fall. We're very engaged with industry. Um, I've actually been meeting myself with uh, the wireless carriers. That's the key, I think, to get the carriers to be open to um, what do you call it? like embracing this instead of just working with incumbent 
hardware providers. So I think it's a critical innovation for our national security, and I'm actually grateful that Congress put that money in the bill. And I thank you, and we'll work with you to continue to expedite that. So I thank you so much for your answer. My next question uh, deals with semiconductor manufacturing tax credits. Uh, without going into too much detail on Section 48D, uh, just wanted to let you know what we were talking about. Earlier this year, Commerce issued proposed guidance for the CHIPS Act's grant programs that defined semiconductor as semiconductor devices only. Uh, and defined semiconductive substances such as polysilicon as material. The Department of Treasury uh, unfortunately relied on this narrow definition in their proposed regulations for implementing the Act's tax credits, excluding investments in U.S. polysilicon manufacturing and other facilities in the supply chain from qualifying for the credit. Uh, I feel that without domestic polysilicon ingot wafer manufacturing, we won't be able to build out our domestic semiconductor manufacturing supply chain. So my question, Madam Secretary, is will you commit to working with the Department of Treasury to issue final regulations that correctly define semiconductor to include semiconductive substances such as polysilicon and wafers, uh, which represent critical parts of the semiconductor manufacturing supply chain? Uh, so, so let me say, this, as you correctly say, this is in Treasury's wheelhouse, so, but yes, I will work with you and Secretary Yellen to look at this issue, um, recognizing that, you know, my authority relates more to the, the grant program, and Secretary Yellen is in charge of the 25% ITC, but I hear you, we can follow up, and we, you know, can talk to the Secretary's team. Thank you, because with that de narrow definition, it does exclude a lot of things that are critically important, in my view, to creating that domestic supply chain. And I think what Treasury did is they respectfully, incorrectly latched on to a very narrow definition, which we'd like to see uh, expanded and broadened. And I thank you, and with that, I yield back. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, now uh, the gentleman from New York would like to recognize Mr. Bowman. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you, Madam Secretary. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your uh, tremendous work. Uh, I'm concerned about the Recompetes program. Uh, in my district, there are many uh, historically marginalized, underserved, redlined, under-resourced communities that lack the infrastructure to go after some of the grant money that is available as part of the Recompetes program. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of supporting these historically marginalized communities and building the infrastructure and accessing the resources that are necessary to create jobs in, you know, like you mentioned earlier, 100K shortage in semiconductor tech jobs that these communities could really benefit from? Can you speak to how to provide more on the ground support for historically uh, marginalized communities? So the, it's a great question, and the whole point of the Recompete program is to make investments in communities that have been historically behind, and our plan is to run an open, you know, merit-based process, then to pick a handful of places to make fairly significant investments, because I know from experience if you're starting, you know, with, with nothing, you need some critical mass, which requires a big investment. Um, we are providing every bit of technical assistance that we can mm -hmm. to help communities to apply. This is an initiative that's um, got a couple of steps in the application process, and we're really trying to provide technical assistance. That being said, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This is tough. I know in Rhode Island, the communities that they, they are left behind, as a result, they don't have you know, much of the infrastructure. They don't have a planning team. They don't have money to hire a lawyer to submit the grant. So we're doing what we can to recognize that. But in your case or anyone's case, if you have a community that you think is worthy with some money, you know, could be successful, then we will reach out to you and we'll help you to help them to apply. Thank you. And I'll have my office follow up with you on that because we definitely want to partner with you in that, in that conversation. Um, I had another question about um, regional tech hubs, regional tech and innovation hubs. So I was proud to contribute ideas to the bill about how we can bring minority women-owned businesses and CDFIs to the table. 
and how we can use the hubs to promote employee ownership and cooperative business models. As you implement these programs, how are you approaching the challenge of building and actually keeping wealth in local communities, particularly vulnerable communities as we just talked about? How do we make sure the benefits don't just go to large corporations and distant investors? With Tech Hub, so yep. let me say something on the Tech Hub initiative. I've never seen anything like this, this oversubscribed. We were appropriated $500 million and we have received over 400 applications. We are massively, massively, massively oversubscribed. 400 applications from 48 states and three territories. We are going through the applications. Um, we're required by statute to designate at least 20, but that means, you know, 380 disappointed places. And I can tell you, you know, these are incredibly high quality applications. So I suppose that's my way of saying, I think at some point you should appropriate more money for this. Yes. Because it was authorized at 10 billion. We got 500 million. It's amazing what we're seeing. And this is the thing that allows us to compete with China, invest in America and all of our technology and all of our communities. Um, so the point in this pro, recompete is for really distressed places. Tech hubs, you know, not so much. Honestly, we want to find places that are really good at some technology, and we can take them from good to great. Mm -hmm. So I don't want you to think that this is for distressed communities. That being said, it's also not just for big companies. Actually, tech hubs, we want to be looking for the next generation. I don't think of it so much as big companies. Chips is big companies. This is for you know, like a startup ecosystem, an R&D ecosystem, a, a, a new innovative way of job training. Um, so that's how we think about it. That's the purpose of it. And I, I, think, I think we'll get that right and make sure we get into every nook and cranny of the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a company in my district, Seek, that works on superconductor-based technology. So I want to give them a shout out uh, as well. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And now the gentleman from California, I recognize Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, you have uh, what some have considered to be the, the key cabinet position because it's, it's really a conglomerate of a, not, a lot of things that didn't necessarily go together, but Congress saw fit to bring them together. Conveniently and interestingly, we're here to talk about the CHIPS Act, but I think what's interesting is two of your key undersecretaries, your, uh, your undersecretary known as the BIS uh, and your undersecretary known as the director of the PTO. When you were in China just uh, days ago, ago. You, uh, you, were, you were bushwhacked, uh, to say the least, by the launch of a 5G phone and the proof that China has, a C, has achieved seven uh, nanometer uh, capability. That wasn't an accident. They chose you as an important symbol of their uh, accomplishment. The tools that are at your disposal, one of them clearly to stop the export of, uh, of technology that allows exactly what has just occurred to occur. The other one, though, is the one I want to focus on for a moment. Uh, even though uh, the Undersecretary for uh, Intellectual Property, the, the PTO director, is somewhat independent, still falls under yours, and the coordination is uniquely yours as the Secretary, my question to you is three of the top ten patent recipients uh, last year were Chinese. Only one was American. The Reality is that Huawei, a company not able to do business in the United States, continues to receive, in often clandestinely through uh, proxies, they continue to receive royalties because they are in fact patenting the technology. And uh, there were a couple people that talked about trees and, uh, and, and valleys. Uh, I'm from Telecom Gulch, San Diego. We are extremely concerned that your administration has to find a way to, to block in a different way. It's not just about a particular device going to China from LAM or some other uh, entity. The reality is that if China's allowed to create blocking and revenue technology 
in 5G, in telecommunication, in a host of areas as they are. The patent system, both directly through real innovation and through what I would call AI blocking, in other words, coming up with patents that envision things that they haven't really reduced to practice, will be used against us to thwart us. What can you do with the combination of those and other tools? Yeah, so let me say this. I would welcome to come sit with you if you have ideas for our consideration. We're trying to do, use every single tool at our disposal, BIS, enforcement, patents, to deny the Chinese an ability to you know, get intellectual property, to advance their technology in ways that can hurt us. Um, it, I was obviously, I don't know what the right word, upset break, you know, when I saw the Huawei announcement. The only good news is there is any is we don't have any evidence that they can manufacture seven nanometer at scale. And although I can't talk about any investigations specifically, I promise you this. Every time we find credible evidence that any company has gone around our export <coughs> controls, we do investigate. But as it relates to IP, I'll come sit with you. I have Kathy Vidal come sit with you. If you have ideas for how we can tighten it up, I want to hear them. Well, I have been able to meet with Kathy. I'd love to meet with you because uh, during the time I left Congress for two years, I w my job was to try to figure out how to compete with Belt and Road. And we don't do it well because we don't coordinate the way China does yeah. in competing against us. I would like to see in technology that we do coordinate yours and other parts of the government. So I'll be happy to meet with you at your convenience. Great. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. And now uh, the, the gentlewoman from New, uh, North Carolina, Ms. Ross. Thank you, Chairman Babin and Ranking Member Lofgren for holding this very important hearing today. And thank you, Madam Secretary, for being with us. North Carolina's semiconductor industry boasts over 100 semiconductor and other electronic component manufacturing establishments, over 7,600 people employed in the sector, and $1.2 billion in exported product. The passage of the Chips and Science Act was critical in re-energizing the U.S. semiconductor production and maintaining America's technological global competitiveness. Um, the Na National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST's extramural uh, manufacturing programs are critical to supporting U.S. domestic manufacturing. And Congress authorized significant plus-ups for both the Manufacturing Extension Partnership and the Manufacturing USA program in the Chips and Science Act with major support from the Biden-Harris administration. But as you know, Congress failed to appropriate funding to these programs at the level set in chips and science. So, Madam Secretary, could you talk about the opportunities that the United States is losing out on by not supporting the Manufacturing Extension Partnership and Manufacturing USA, and how would a decrease in funding to these programs affect domestic manufacturing? Uh, thank you for your question. So I think it's very significant. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about securing our national security, competing with China. Just the exchange I just had with Congressman Issa relates to what we can do on defense. But my strongly held view is that what we do on offense matters so much more. Um, you know, there's only so much we can do. As you just said, China's coordinated, they're investing. We need to be coordinated and invest. And the reality is that over the past 30 years, this country has taken its eye off the ball of manufacturing. And when you don't manufacture, you lose out on innovation, and you become dependent on other countries. So every investment we make in MEP, MEP is a great program. You all have MEPs in your states. They, they are very well run. They help small companies to do innovation and manufacturing. They're the ones who are going to find you know, the next semiconductor manufacturing innovation, the next, you know, interesting battery technology. And so I would say we're working hard on the Manufacturing USA. We're going to announce the topics this fall. There'll be a competition, merit-based. We'll stand it up next year. But, yeah, any dollar, that's short-changing MEP or Manufacturing USA short-changes America's national security and our ability to invest in our own manufacturing capacity. 
Great. Um, final question, um, back to NIST. I know that the Department of Commerce, primarily through NIST, is looking to increase its investments in quantum information science. Where do you believe the Department of Commerce should focus its efforts for the next five years um, with through the National Quantum Initiative? I'm going to have to get back to you on that. A, a quantum expert I am not, but I will have Dr. Lacasio and her team follow up with you. Okay, and just to um, tell you why I think that's so important, some of this we're doing catch up, or we seeded um, our semiconductor um, stature to other countries when we put yeah. manufacturing there. On quantum, we can be the leaders, and we already are. Yeah. Um, maybe Representative Fushi will ask about this, but if you've never been to the Duke Quantum Science Center to see what, what is going on for the future, it's amazing. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, thank you. I think we do, we lead the world in quantum, we lead the world in AI, and I will have Lacasio follow up with you. Thank you very much. And I uh, now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Franklin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Madam Secretary. Appreciate you spending time with us here today. Um, it's a very important topic, and I'd love to talk uh, more about chips. Um, unfortunately, since I do have you present, I would like to follow up on something that, that our office has been trying to get uh, some answers on for a while. And as much as we all are tired of talking about the, the topic, it, it, it concerns COVID. Um, I hail from Central Florida. Uh, the hurricane hunters that fly for NOAA are, are in my hometown of Lakeland. And uh, as a former naval aviator, I made it a career practice to avoid flying into storms, but was uh, invited at a point to go flying with the hurricane hunters, and I was looking forward to doing that. Uh, back in July, when I was going to uh, do all the paperwork necessary to do that, I was surprised to find that I would have to supply uh, my status of COVID, uh, COVID vaccine, uh, vaccine status, and be willing to submit to a test or, or show proof that I didn't have COVID at the time. That kind of came as a surprise to me, uh, considering that the administration had declared an end to the pandemic. And, uh, and I'm, I should have done this before, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I request unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, a letter I sent to the Secretary back in July, as well as uh, the Department of Commerce's COVID-19 workplace safety uh, plan that was dated in July of 2023. Um, Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, so our staff started doing some research and finding out why. Why would we still be requiring this? And as it turns out, you know, I read in, um, in your department's own plan that uh, the department does not require on-site contractor employees and visitors to provide information about their vaccine status uh, at this time. Additionally, on-site contractor employees and visitors are not required to show proof of a negative COVID-19 test when entering uh, in or a, a DOC facility, all Department of Commerce, regardless of their vaccine status. Um, there's a disconnect there that I'm really puzzled about because somewhere between your desk and the deck plate level, uh, someone's decided to create their own policy. And I, in no way do I fault the folks who are at the, at the tip of the spear trying to get this done. But I, you know, 41 of my colleagues and I sent you a letter back in July asking for information about this. We still, I'm sure it's languishing in someone's inbox, but I, I am curious, why would NOAA still be requiring this at this time? Particularly yeah. an organization that's, that's nothing but scientists who presumably are following the science every day. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for your question. Let me say a few things. First, I'm sorry we haven't replied yet. I'm constantly trying to get better and quicker at replying, and we'll get your reply this week. Secondly, I don't know, and I'll look into it. I do know, um, you know, they're very close quarters in these hurricane hunters. They're tiny, and it could, it could be that, but I'll get you a proper answer. Um, thirdly, I do want to take 10 seconds to say thank you to, the, to my team that operates these hurricane hunters. It's been an unbelievably busy season. We only have two hurricane hunters that can fly into the thick of the storm. You're braver than I. I'm, they've asked me to try well, I don't it. fly into hurricanes. Uh, and I'm not willing to right. do that. But um, I am going to take this occasion to ask Congress for additional funding. We have two planes. They're old. We operate a fleet of nine hurricane hunters. They are all old. They need maintenance. I had to take one down during a hurricane because right. of maintenance. So I'll get your proper answers to your questions. But I do want to say that team is working around the clock, and we need Congress's support to maintain this fleet. No, I do fully support them, and I would support uh, more resources for them. I, I do understand Miss Piggy was down, wasn't able to fly into the storm when we needed that data the most. I'm also concerned about uh, the implications for NOAA staff. You know, our, our staff... 
uh, members of NOAA required to show vaccine status now because that's also not in accordance yeah. with the administration. So I, I really would like to have those answers. Yes, I'll and, get you uh, the answers. We have a policy that is science-based, as you say. Um, and so I'll follow up. Very, very good. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And I yield back. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now the gentleman from Illinois. I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Sorensen. I want to thank the uh, chairman and ranking member for convening the hearing and Secretary Raimondo for uh, your willingness to appear today. Um, and just to continue on the subject, um, in my previous life, I was a meteorologist. And so I really appreciate um, your support for those who put themselves in harm's way. Um, it go flying into the hurricane so that we have the data to better forecast where these killer storms are going to go. Um, so I would invite you uh, to come to our office uh, so that I could help champion how we can find the funding uh, for the Hurricane Hunter aircraft to protect lives and property. Thank um, you. The Chips and Science Act included $50 billion for CHIPS for America Fund, $39 billion for implementation uh, for manufacturing incentive programs, and $11 billion for R&D and workforce development. $39 billion, that's a huge investment in chips manufacturing. However, the cost of manufacturing is very high, more than will be covered by this investment. Uh, we need industry to capitalize on the investments made in chips. In the last year, CHIPS program office has staffed up and released two notice of funding opportunity announcements. Uh, one of those was for the $39 billion for the Semiconductors Financial Assistance Program, uh, which has received hundreds of statements of inquiry. Um, in your perspective, have the investments made through CHIPS and Science Act incentivize and uh, catalyze the investment of private capital in the CHIPS economy on the scale that we need? Mm. So it's a great question. Uh, Yes. So let me say, although $39 billion is an enormous amount of taxpayer money and it's an unprecedented program, it really is a drop in the bucket, rel you know, a, relative to the mission we have to meet. Since the President signed the Chips and Science Act, there's been more than $300 billion of private investment or announced into the semiconductor industry. So that's why I answer yes to your question. Like if we continue to go on a path that for every dollar we invest, there's $10 or more of private capital, then you know what that I feel good about mm. that. But it is necessary, which is why, you know, my job is to cut the best deal possible for the taxpayer right. to, to draw in as much private capital as possible. How does our investment compare with China's investment today? Much lower. Much lower. I mean, uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but ch you know, China. I th I think China has. I'll get to the exact number, but I think they have like a hundred and forty-five billion dollar fund just for semiconductors, and they've oh. announced massive investments, state subsidies in in legacy chips and mature node chips. So, much lower. But you know, our private sector is the envy of the world. You know, we're not a you know state-run economy, nor do we want to be one. So we will compete and win, and I, we're not going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them for public money. We're going to out-innovate them and draw in private sector capital, which is why the question you're asking is uh, so hard. So it's, it's the right question, and we have to make sure it happens. How do we make sure that we meet the workforce requirements when we go forward? I know that was brought up before. Um, and, and how can Congress be part of the solution? You know, I think c c Congress needs to continue to fund workforce. Workforce, apprenticeships, job training, these aren't social programs. These are essential business investments for America to compete. You know, when, when I think about, if you say to me, Secretary, what is success in implementing the CHIPS Act? It isn't just incentivizing a dozen new fabs. It's getting colleges and universities to put out three times as many engineers. It's getting you know every community college in America to have a semiconductor technician um, certification program. It's getting high school students, you know, to be taught vocational training and things that relate to the chip industry. So I say continue to fund it and don't look at it as a soft investment. It's actually every bit as important to invest in our people as it is in our tanks and missiles and you know hardware. Great, appreciate that perspective and I yield back. Thank you, sir. Um, now uh, the 
I'd like to recognize Mr. Baird, the gentleman from Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member, for holding this session, and thank you for being here, Madam Secretary. We appreciate it. My question uh, is, you know, that among the requirements for those seeking CHIPS funding, they must comply with the NEPA, or the National Environmental Policy Act, and other environmental uh, laws and other executive orders. So tying NEPA compliance to CHIPS funding means that any company applying through any of the funding opportunities, including the upcoming one focused on R&D, will need to navigate this process. Mm -hmm. And for some firms, uh, that carrying out the environmental uh, reviews is familiar. Uh, it is resource intensity, and the process is feeble given to the bandwidth and capital that they have at their disposal. However, uh, the smaller businesses in the semiconductor materials and equipment sector, there's a real risk that the requirement to comply with NEPA may impact the disbursement of CHIPS funding and or slow down the pace of construction. So here's my question. How is the CHIPS program office working with its industry partners, particularly small business applicants, to assuage this concern? And how can the CHIPS program office work with state and local authorities to reduce the potential for duplicative compliance activities that might further delay the construction of new fabs of other manufacturing centers? Thank you for your very important question. Um, you're right, NEPA takes a long time. And so I have built a little team in the CHIPS office to do just NEPA, which is to say to provide help and assistance, technical assistance to applicants so they can have a NEPA plan which makes sense. Uh, I will say there is currently a bipartisan amendment to the Defense Authorization Act, which would help a lot. So we're going to do everything we can with our own team to help streamline NEPA and move it as quickly as is prudent. But if Congress could pass the amendment, I think it's the Cruz-Kelly Amendment in the Authorization Act, it would help us a lot to move faster. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is in the chip, the way we're implementing chips is we're trying to incentivize states, to your point, trying to incentivize states to help us with the permitting. And so, for example, states, we've encouraged states, governor's offices, to put in place a point of contact on permitting for chips. So it's just like in the governor's office, a chips permitting team, because um, that's we're trying to, like you just said, streamline between the feds and the state requirements, and we're giving like a, you know, like a pr plus one to states that actually do that. There's no easy solution on this. I worry about it myself. And like I said, we have I have a very good team of NEPA experts trying to, you know, work the system properly so that we get it done as quickly as we can. Thank you. That's good to hear. You know, I got to give a shout out to my uh, alma mater. Purdue University, they're working, uh, doing a lot of work in this chips area. They've gone from a small little wafer to an 18, up to an 18 inch wafer now to make the chips. So, and they're, they're training these young people to, uh, and students. So I just want to give them a shout out for the good work in the chips area. So I'm so. smiling because uh, one of the best visits I've taken on my, as my tenure was to Purdue. I mean, I've loved all my visits, but um, Mitch Daniels is a friend of mine, former governor, and what he did there was amazing. But I spent the day at Purdue, and I even went to a chips job fair at Purdue, and I got to meet some of the professors there, what they're doing in chips. It's like right on target. If every community did that in this country, there'd be no stopping us. Uh, Ch uh, Mitch Daniels is my friend too, but anyway, Purdue, and, and you, we would really appreciate you taking the time to be there. Yeah, I've already been once. It was a great trip and happy to go back. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I'd like to recognize the uh, gentlelady from Oregon, Ms. Salinas. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to you and the ranking member for holding this hearing, and thank you, Secretary Raimondo, for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, so just before we get started on some of my questions that relate back to my, my district, you've mentioned a lot of announcements coming this fall, and I know a lot of the money has already been, the funding has been appropriated, but how would a shutdown, a government shutdown, actually affect all the rollouts and timelines that you are facing right now? It would be crushing. Uh, you know, I, when I talk to members of Congress, they say, how come you're not moving faster on ships? You know, where's this, where's that? We are literally working seven days a week to go as fast as we can. If there is a shutdown, it'll come to a grinding halt. I mean, there is no question in my mind that a shutdown will hurt America's national security, at least as it relates to my work. Export control enforcement, export control work, investment of the CHIPS money, investment of the Tech Cup money, it all stops. And every dollar and every day that we aren't working, you know, puts us greater at risk. Thank you. And as we know, as Oregon is not only home to Intel and companies like LAM Research, which is actually in my district, and they manufacture chips as well, we host a significant uh, manufacturing hub that contributes to the semiconductor supply chain. And these are really good paying jobs. And I hear from these smaller companies, though, machinists, for example, that it was a huge shock for their businesses when chip fabrication initially started moving overseas. And in some cases, these businesses took many years to recover, and they may hesitate to fully jump back in because of that experience. So as we look to jumpstart this essential industry, how should we be thinking long-term about the supports to ensure that this isn't just a one-off investment, but that we are really bringing this industry and these jobs back permanently for the long haul? Yeah. Uh, I think a few things. Um, we need to embrace innovation, including artificial intelligence which will bring down the cost of a lot of this production in a way that it could enable us to keep it in the United States. The other thing is that's why we, honestly, that is why we have the CHIPS initiative. It is you know, much more expensive to build one of these huge facilities in the US relative to Asia, and that's why I think this is a good investment. Right? Like We want to pay workers a, a good wage in America. We want labor standards. We need environmental standards. So we can't back away from high standards. We need to innovate to bring down costs. And then, um, you know, that's why the go I think it's appropriate in this case for the government to have a program of this kind. I also will tell you, as I talk to c big customers of semiconductors, I won't name names, but, you know, companies that consume huge quantities of chips, they're increasingly willing, in some cases, to pay more for U.S. made because they see how vulnerable they are mm -hmm. when they buy all of these chips from, say, one country in Asia. So if they can pay a premium to have US-made chips, you know, um, I think they're increasingly willing to do that because it adds business value. That's right. That's right. Thank you. As you know, the Chips and Science Act appropriated $11 billion for R&D activities, including the creation of the National Semiconductor Technology Center, as you mentioned earlier. Oregon's existing infrastructure in chips, including everything from cutting edge research to the manufacturing supply chain to high volume fabrication capacity, uniquely positions the state to serve as a hub for domestic R&D. How are you thinking about leveraging existing resources such as Oregon's leading edge and high volume manufacturing capabilities and our extensive supply chain to maximize NSTC investments? We are thinking of doing that. Like, so what we envision is creating a whole network. The, the NSTC, we want to be a neutral, science-based place or series of places that existing universities, tech hubs, networks, like you say, can kind of hook into. So the point of it is to tap into what exists, invest into it so it grows, and to, like if we succeed, the NSTC will be this this place that, as it says, is neutral and is um, science-based so that all institutions feel comfortable interacting with it. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. And now the, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. McCormick. Thank you, sir, and thank you, Ms. Secretary, for being here with us today. 
Uh, it's limited, so I'll get right to the point. Space Policy Directive 3 transferred the responsibility for civilian space situational awareness from the Pentagon to the Department uh, of Commerce. From what I understand is, since it's transferred away from the Pentagon, most other agencies that are monitoring uh, have been using commercialized monitoring, but you're kind of de developing your own system itself. How's that going to differ from the Pentagon, and why not rely on the commercial industry rather than creating your own kind of which seems duplicitous and fairly expensive? Yeah, good, great question. So th we are going to work with the Pentagon, and we will absolutely leverage commercial capacity. And we haven't made any specific plans. We're still you know, working in the interagency, including with the Pentagon, to finalize this. All of that being said, there's a need for a space situational awareness you know, program not that different from you know, FAA and air traffic control to keep track of the commercial congestion in space of the commercial satellites. Space is becoming, you know, a lot of traffic, very congested, which increases probability of collision, danger, et cetera. So I know we're real short on time. Yeah, Specifically, sorry. like we have places like Leo Labs and stuff like that, people who are kind of doing that already, and they have, actually have broader access to more locations than we would have, which we'd have to recreate in the department. My question is, why not use those civilian agencies and that coordination between commercial instead of recreating your own infrastructure, which would seem to be much more expensive? We will work with them, but we think it's necessary for the federal government to have our own you know, proprietary system. Okay. Um, I want to talk real quick about China and the massive satellite launches that they have right now. They're going to be at basically the same kind of orbit, the LEO orbit. Uh, I think of it somewhere around 13,000 uh, that they've asked to launch up to space and how we're going to track that. Basically, my question is, what is the Department of Commerce doing to establish data sharing and transparency uh, to keep all that in a safe space given our limited uh, ability to share information right now? China's not playing ball, and they're not allowing us to track in the same way. Uh, and we can't just rely on... on um, Radar tracking, I know it's going to get harder as people come up with new technology and stuff like that. How do we force their hands to kind of come to the table and share the information to keep our space, especially in LEO, uh, from, from being on a collision course? Yeah. Let, um, l let me do this. I, my Deputy Secretary, Don Graves, along with Rich Dalbello, who runs Space Commerce, can give you a much better answer, a more detailed answer to that on LEO. So... Let me connect you with them and come back to you with the proper answer. Uh, it's complex questions. I yeah, yeah. Uh, final complex question. Uh, I'm more very, very interested in uh, the AI production, the actual hardware that we're producing in Taiwan. You mentioned it, the opening Chips Act, uh, and that we we rely heavily on the hardware that's produced in Taiwan. China says we're going to take Taiwan. I take them for the word. If they do, what then? We we're two years away from even you know. Once you break ground, it takes two years to build that kind of capacity locally. Yeah. Um, would we have to then, do we have a, a way to keep them from getting that technology and actually uh, reverse engineering and actually having the capability to produce it and not give it to us? If they take the, you know, in other words, are we going to have to destroy those places in place? How do we keep us on even kill or even ahead where we belong, uh, given that our entire capacity for production is in Taiwan right now? Yeah. My answer to that question is we ju I have to do everything every single day to go as fast as possible to increase domestic manufacturing. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals about what China will and won't do and when they'll do it. I know that we are vulnerable. We buy all of those chips you're talking about, the AI chips, the leading edge chips, all of that. None of them are made in America right now, which is why I've got to work like crazy every day to to bring that manufacturing home um, as fast as we can. I don't, there's no shortcut around that. Because hmm. we need them at scale. You know, like AI consumes massive numbers of chips. It's not like you can make a small number of chips for AI. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, the only solution, at least that I can think of, is move faster in America and build fabs in America to produce those chips at scale. I just try to, I'll close with this, just saying that I think the CHIPS Act kind of didn't address that fully, that we really don't have that production capability, nor do we even have a plan to, the, the plants aren't, haven't started being built here for the AI chips, and I'm really worried about that. Thanks. With that, I'll close. Okay. Thank you. And I'd like to recognize the gentlewoman, Ms. Fushi.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Loughran for holding this meeting today. And Secretary Raimondo, it is good to see you again. Thank you for being willing to appear before us again today. I was proud to join you and President Biden earlier this year in North Carolina's fourth, which is my district, for the president's first stop on the Investing in America tour. And I thank you for talking with us about the success of CHIPS in science and where we're heading. I am proud that in my district, um, it includes the North Carolina Biotechnology Center, who leads the Accelerate North Carolina Life Sciences Manufacturing Coalition, a recipient and winner of the Economic Development Agency's Build Back Better Regional Challenge. This funding has helped to dramatically increase the capacity of the state's education system to prepare North Carolina residents for high quality, well-paying jobs and expands entry-level biotechnology training programs at 10 community colleges across the state. North Carolina Central University in my district is also leading a network of the state's HBCUs and one historically American Indian University to establish six training hubs. How do you believe these tech hubs programs will complement the efforts of the CHIPS office to reinvigorate the U.S. domestic semiconductor manufacturing sector? Good morning. Nice to see you. To see you. Um, they're meant to work together. They're meant to work together. Um, if we do this right, the NSTC, which we just talked about, will work with um, Manufacturing USA, the MEPs, the tech hubs, uh, as I said, I've been blown away by, we have 400 tech hub applications from 48 states, really high quality applications. So if we do it right, we'll have a whole web all over America with different, investing in different parts of the supply chain, in space, in quantum, in artificial intelligence, in biotechnology. Um, you know, feeding, you know, planting seeds of innovation all over the place, uh, which then will help these, our biggest companies, you know, for example, like a company like Intel that will be making these chips, to be that much, you know, more successful and innovative. So what we're trying to build is like a whole ecosystem of the workforce, the research and development, and the actual manufacturing. Thank you for that. And I'm sure you've heard from many corners now that everyone wishes you just hurry up and get the money out the door. <laughs> it's true. After all, reshoring our semiconductor manufacturing <laughs> capacity was a sufficiently urgent national priority to rally bipartisan support to enact the Chips and Science Act and to provide the $50 billion in funding. At the same time, we want and need you to get this right. Can you assure us you are doing everything you can to move as quickly as possible to get the funding out the door? And can you please talk about the timeline for additional funding opportunities and where you see the future of the CHIPS program heading? Mm. So, look, I feel the pressure. I promise you that. I know we have to move fast, fast as the conversation we just had. We are behind. But it, it is more important that we get it right. And if we take another month or a few more weeks to get it right, I will defend that because it's necessary. Uh, by the way, a shutdown sets us back in a huge way. You know, sending people home and slowing down our work, that would be a, a huge problem. So yes, I assure you we're, we're moving as fast as we can and we're doing everything we can to achieve the national security goals for, for that were intended to be achieved by the statute. Uh, the next phase, you know, I think that what I've said is the CHIPS program is about manufacturing, but we also have to think about uh, advanced packaging happening in the United States. It's an interesting thing that, you know, we could make all the chips in America, but if we then send them to Asia to be tested and packaged, that's a problem. So we have to package in the United States. Uh, we have to do the research and in increase research and development in the United States. And a comment, of, I forget who asked me, we've got to bring down the cost of manufacturing chips. That happens through innovation. So when you say what comes next, I think that's what has to come next. 
bending the cost curve so this can be sustainable in the United States? Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Now the gentleman from California recognized Mr. Obernoti. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, thanks for the testimony today. This is a topic that's very important to me and I think to everyone on this dais. I'd like to ask about something that you just brought up, since, since you brought it up, uh, the, the issue of packaging. Uh, that's something that I also have been very concerned about because uh, obviously if uh, we can't construct the packaging for these chips and, and use that to dissipate the heat from them and in, incorporate them into integrated circuit boards, there, there's, it doesn't matter where they're made. Uh, if we're not doing the packaging here domestically, that represents an equally uh, potent threat to our supply chain. And yet, uh, as you re remarked, nearly all of that packaging is currently done overseas. Uh, I think all of our U.S. chip manufacturers do their packaging overseas, you know, by and large. I think 81% 80, of the world's packaging is done in Asia. So I, I think that this is a really potent threat. I know that uh, this is something we've all been talking about. Uh, part of the Chips and Sciences Act establishes a, a, a national advanced packaging manufacturing program and dedicated two and a half billion dollars to get that spun up. Can you give us an update on that and uh, your confidence level that we can solve the packaging problem at the same time we solve the chip manufacturing problem? Yeah, uh, my confidence level is high because we have to. Right? Like we have no choice. And relative to the question before, it's going to require a lot of private sector capital. Um, in our plan, in our strategy plan, our strategy paper, which we put out earlier this year, we would like to have uh, multiple high volume advanced packaging facilities in the United States. So s several, like you say, advanced packaging. Um, as you well know, you're expert in this, you know, there's some, there's some, I hate to use the word like commodity packaging. I'm not sure, you know, how much of that will be in the U.S., but certainly the leading edge packaging, the most sophisticated packaging, that's essential for the future. Chips can only get so small. You know, I'm not a scientist, but what I understand is we're coming to the end of Moore's Law and chips can only get so small, which means it's all, the special sauce is in the packaging and we have to have that in America. Period, and I think we will, and we're focused on it. Right, great, I'm glad to hear that. Um, you know, talking about what you just brought up again, uh, you know, the fact that we're reaching some of the theoretical limits of our ability to create faster chips using silicon, you know, that highlights the fact that silicon is not the only semiconductor out there, and there is increasing interest in other semiconductors, uh, uh, particularly sub semiconductors such as indium phosphide that are optical semiconductors with higher electron velocities than silicon. And uh, those are, will probably be very useful in applications like quantum computing, which I know is, is something that we're all very uh, interested in making sure that the U.S. retains a leadership role on. So I was uh, a little alarmed to hear the efforts uh, recently of Huawei in uh, establishing scale production of indium phosphate at locations such as the Wuhan Optics Valley in China. Do we have a plan to dedicate some of the CHIPS funding to increase uh, the production of these optical semiconductors in the United States? Yes, I don't know. I, I just made a note and I'll have my team follow up with you. I don't know um, precisely uh, you know, which areas, but I can promise you we're very focused on it, whether it's Indian phosphate or silicon carbide, um, we're trying to stimulate the innovation. Like we're trying to, we just had a meeting on it the other day and they're saying like we gotta go to where the, where the puck is going, not where it is now, which is what you're talking about. So yes, I am confident that we are evaluating all those future technologies and inc incorporating that into the way we're gonna invest the incentives. Right. I'm glad to hear it, uh, let's, let's continue that discussion. Thanks for being here today, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce the uh, gen gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Jackson. Good morning. Good, mo <laughs> good morning. There are three members from North Carolina in this committee. You've heard from two of them. They were there. Yes, I saw. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Representative Fushi and Representative Ross both represent part of the Research Triangle, which already has a wonderful reputation for being a tech hub, mm. Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill. I represent a new district that was just created in the last census that's the Charlotte region. And part of my job up here is to tell a new story for that region to update people's understanding because we have earned a reputation as our own tech center. 
for a lot of different reasons. One of the nation's leading financial centers, mm -hmm. and on and on. Mm -hmm. um, you said that part of your job is to get the best possible deal for the taxpayer. I want you to do that, but um, would be remiss if I didn't use this opportunity to, to use my voice to update in your thinking what this region means, mm -hmm. what it means to the state, and what it means to the country, because it's just grown a heck of a lot, and it already is a tech hub, uh, and would surely benefit from official recognition as such. I think we all know what success looks like for the CHIPS Act 20 years from now. I think we can have a vision of what a successful semiconductor industry, a mature semiconductor industry looks like. My question is, what does success look like five years from now? Mm. What are the, the markers that tell you that this is headed in the right direction? My sense is that mm. the CHIPS Act shouldn't best be understood as an industry subsidy, but as an industry catalyst. Exactly. Because we don't have the money to continue to subsidize this industry as the Chinese government would. So we have to light a very expensive spark, and that spark has to catch fire. Now, you've said, you've given me a couple of possible uh, metrics that you might be tracking here. Workforce is one. Cost of manufacturing going down is another. Private sector investment may be the biggest. So five years from now, what do you want to see that's going to give you confidence that this spark has produced a flame? Yeah, th I mean, that was so well said, and I appreciate it. First, let me say this on Tech Hubs. Uh, we are committed to supporting every Tech Hub that's designated, which is to say we have a very limited amount of money. Not every Tech Hub will get the money. Some of the ones that are designated will. Some of them won't. But we are working on ways that we can use existing funds in the Commerce Department and across the government to support the tech hubs that are designated. So when you said you'd appreciate being designated, I wanted everyone to know, we're gonna put our back into supporting all the designees, even the ones that don't get a tech hub money. Um, second thing, you know, it's here's what I think. Um, five years from now, if we do our job right, we will have in construction facilities to do at least two facilities to do leading edge chip manufacturing. S same thing for leading edge packaging. I mean, actually, in five years from now, they should be up and running more than, more than in construction. So we should have new at scale fabs producing leading edge chips in the United States. Same thing for packaging. Same thing for advanced memory at scale. The NSTC will have will be established. There'll be you know several centers around the country um, doing research and development. We'll have a fund established to make investments in uh, you know smaller companies, and we'll have one or more manufacturing USAs up and running. So, I think that the the five year mark is a really important mark because it's the time that you know, these fabs should be coming online and we should be you know, making these chips at scale. I also, the last thing I'll say is if we do our job right with all of the um, uh, workforce, you know, we'll start to see like a, a totally new way of training people to do these semiconductor jobs. And it's not just semiconductors, you know, they're tech technicians, cyber technicians and such. So it's a pretty, it's a grand vision, and I think five or six years, we'll, we will have achieved a lot of that. Thank you. I yield back. All right, thank you very much. And now the recognized gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Tinney. Uh, thank you, Chairman Babin and Ranking Member Loughran, and thank you, Secretary Raimondo, for being here. Um, I am just so uh, privileged to represent New York's 24th District uh, which has a strong history uh, of tech. We have IBM, Corning in upstate New York. Uh, the Erie Canal was, uh, is really one of the first regions to really bring us into the Industrial Revolution. But unfortunately, upstate New York has suffered tremendously because of Chinese-based entities flooding our market with uh, over-subsidized cheap goods. Uh, many of our strong domestic manufacturing has moved overseas. Uh, and we've lost industry jobs and uh, you know, brought on huge mass out-migration in New York, as everyone knows. Uh, we were the ones that kind of got this started. North Carolina's kind of taken, taken over. But we do have an opportunity now to bring manufacturing and especially the high-tech semiconductor 
uh, manufacturing research here. We're really excited about the advent of, of the new Micron announcement, the facility coming in Clay, New York. Um, we think it's a great first step. Uh, but I want to ask you, uh, I want to talk about the, first of all, the Buffalo, and we t you talked about the hubs uh, and some of the tech hubs that were going to be funded uh, p potentially. Um, I, my, my district spans across all of upstate New York. It's a huge, long district. I go from the Buffalo region to Rochester, Syracuse, all the way to Watertown, circling Lake Hunt, Ontario. So Buffalo, Rochester, and Syracuse have come together. We're, we're doing this as a regional approach. The New York Smart Eye Corridor Tech Hub, uh, it's a proposal that we're hoping could leverage our regional labor market, existing semiconductor and microchip industry. Some of these are holdovers from the original investments many, many years ago when New York was at its high. Uh, and draw new investments in the private sector, as my colleague from North Carolina talked about. It's really important to get the buy-in and the investment from the private sector, which we're seeing. Uh, and um, I just wanted to also extend some gratitude here because we have other members that are very involved in this bipartisan uh, reach on this proposal. Representative Morelli, who I kind of surround in Rochester area, Representative Higgins in the Buffalo area, uh, Representative Langworthy, uh, Molinaro, and also uh, Representative Williams, who serves on this committee. Um, but my question for you is, I just, I don't want to, are you aware of the New York Smart, Smart Eye Corridor Tech Hub proposal that has been, are you specifically aware of it has been yes, indicated? Yes, I am aware of it. I know you're taking that regional approach to all come together. As, as I said before, we have hundreds of applications. All of them are quite excellent. So we're going through them now, and we'll make announcements pretty shortly this fall. Okay, so... Uh, the phase two tech hub notice of funding opportunities um, are going out. Is there still a plan or is there an update on phase two tech hub NOFO? Is that going to be released as well? This fall, yes. Okay. Um, let me ask you something. Are these going to be contingent on phase one designation? Uh, can we uh, expect phase one tech hub designees to be notified as well? Yes. Okay. So what I was saying to Congressman Jackson, they were required by statute to designate at least 20. Okay. And they have to be regionally diverse to make sure that the money doesn't just go to cities, you know, rural as well. Mm -hmm. So there'll be designations and then uh, and then some and then some will receive that then some will receive like a planning grant and then a subset will receive a larger grant. But what I was saying is even if the, you don't get the larger grant, but you're designated, we're committed to providing as much government support as we can to all the designees through, say, other commerce money or you know, other money in the interagency, mm -hmm. like the SBA and such. The reality is we just need more money for these tech hubs. I mean, it was in the Chips and Science Program, authorized at $10 billion, appropriated at $500 million. And so even the subset of the designees that receive the bigger grants, um, you know, I, I, I can tell you this. We have a merit-based team. They're going to go through to evaluate. All of the ones that are designated are probably worthy for big grants. Like, they're high quality, but we just don't have enough money. Well, we, we urge you to uh, obviously choose our, our tech hub, but we, we appreciate your <laughs> testimony and hard work. We, we think we put together a great team of bipartisan effort and, and uh, really just grateful to all the representatives in upstate New York for coming back because we, I, again, we were once the, uh, the champions of industry and innovation and, and uh, we need to come back and uh, we have a great opportunity with this huge investment coming from Micron. So uh, we appreciate your testimony. My time has run out, but thank you so yeah. much. I, 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 I hear you. I would say I have heard from more members of Congress on tech hubs than anything else that I've done. It's, not, it's unbelievable. We're, we protect our turf there. I love it. I love the advocacy. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, a gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Sykes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, for this meeting. And, and Madam Secretary, really appreciate you being here. I'm going to talk about something different, regional tech hubs. Uh, we That was a joke. I guess it wasn't funny. Uh, <laughs> similar to my other colleagues here, would appreciate your full consideration of the regional tech hub uh, from our community that is not based in one of the largest cities in the state. Um, coming from Ohio's 13th congressional district, we do have a, a bit of a shadow over us from the larger cities, including Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati. Uh, in Columbus, where central Ohio is, we know that 
in Central Ohio where the Intel project is, we hear a lot about uh, the work from your agency and what is going to happen, but uh, I yeah. encourage you to look at us uh, in Northeastern Ohio, as well as some other areas, smaller areas that have a lot to contribute to the opportunities to onshore chip manufacturing, as well as other domestic energy, uh, excuse me, domestic manufacturing uh, in places that are very much used to doing so and have the spirit to do it as well and not to mention the talent. I want to also thank you for your commitment to Northeast Ohio. We were in uh, Cleveland together to announce uh, some minority business opportunities, which is important to getting more uh, folks into these industries, and uh, recently held a webinar around uh, accessing CHIPS funding for our community. We welcomed economic development companies, uh, large businesses, nonprofits, as well as our universities, and they had a lot of questions. And I uh, know that we submitted those to your office and look forward to the responses uh, at, that we get from them. Just really want to hone in on the workforce conversation because there's not an industry that I've met with that has said that they aren't struggling with the workforce and certainly in manufacturing and technology we experience that as well. And want to highlight your comment that child care is not a social issue, it's a business decision, thank you for that. Um, but specifically if you could talk to us about the uh, private businesses and what incentives or encouragement are you sharing with them to make sure we're getting locally based, Ohio based folks on these Ohio based projects. Certainly we take pride in the work that we're doing, but we wanna make sure that folks in our communities are accessing them. How are you encouraging, incentivizing, demanding, mandating, if you will, uh, those folks to work with our, our local employees? Great, excellent, thank you. And it was great to visit with you. I thought we had a great visit. By the way, I just again wanna say on tech hubs, I hear what you're saying and we take that into account. Um, just because you're in a place that might not be Columbus or might not be, you know, rally, uh, as your colleague said, we're going to look, take a hard look at the quality of the application, the quality of the technology that's in your community, and, you know, make those merit-based decisions. With respect to your other question, um, I would say for the CHIPS money, we are requiring every company that applies as part of their application to show us their workforce plan. And I've actually built a team in the CHIPS office who just works with these companies to develop their workforce plans. And the reason I'm doing that is because I gotta protect taxpayer money. I cannot give all this money to a company and then have them fail because they can't, you know, f find the talent they need to run the fab. So, and the same thing for childcare. You know, you won't find the talent if you can't hire and retain women. So we are asking every company to do what you just said. What are your relationships with local universities, with local high schools, with local training partners, with local community colleges? How are you going to train the people in the community to do the jobs in your facilities? Um, these fabs are, are massive. 5,000 people to build them, 5,000 people to work there. And so the, that's why when I say I'm the workforce is as, as as important as the technology it is, and they got to train the people in the community um, if they're you know going to be successful. Thank you for your answer, and thank you, Mr. Chair. You're back. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> thank you. And now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Keene. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, mm. Secretary Raimondo, for, for being here today. Good morning. Um, and I will talk a little bit about the tech hubs as well for as a strong advocate for New Jersey because um, we have a rich history of fostering uh, innovative entrepreneurs and institutions like Rutgers universities are leading the way with proposals for initiatives such as the regional technology and, uh, and innovation hub program making it crucial to recognize the importance of tech hubs and fueling the spirit of innovation um, can you continue to talk a little bit about the premise of the tech hubs and why they're so important yeah absolutely I've been to Rutgers I visited Rutgers um, I don't know, a year or so ago, so I saw with my own eyes the impressive work that's happening there in robotics and other areas. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of the tech hubs, including if you are successful in New Jersey, is to find the next leading edge in uh, innovation in artificial intelligence, quantum, biotech, AI, all of the things that are going to allow America to have a, have a lead in the world. 
And it starts in universities. It starts in someone's lab somewhere and then gets translated into maybe a startup and then to a bigger company. So the point of the tech hubs is to have a whole network of these little like beehives of innovation mm -hmm. um, where you bring together universities with companies, with innovators and entrepreneurs and add some money to catalyze that kind of cutting edge, which ultimately leads to jobs. You know, every, like talking to New Jersey, Bell, think about Bell Labs. Think about all the jobs and innovation that's in spun out of there. In, yes. In but, my district, I was there in the last couple weeks. It's amazing, right? I mean, amazing, amazing, amazing. Thousands and thousands of companies and people came out of that. Let's recreate mm -hmm. that with tech hubs all across the country. Right. Well, that's why this district that I represent is an innovation and, and infrastructure uh, district and uh, continue to have those priorities. Uh, we need to continue to find that common ground. Can you talk a little bit about um, export controls and the uh, importance of how we use export uh, controls in our uh, competition uh, with the PRC? Yeah, so that's the other side of the coin. Tech Hubs is investing in America, export controls. We have to make sure that China doesn't have access to our most cutting edge technology. Since I've been secretary, uh, we've added over 700 PRC entities to the entity list. More than one third of all the Chinese entities on the list were put there under the Biden administration. And it's because we can't be selling our most sophisticated artificial intelligence chips or other technology to the PRC so that they can get it to put in their military and use it in a way to undercut our national security. Um, I would say to everyone here, BIS needs more funding. We need more export enforcement agents. We need more tech experts. Like increasingly, national security is about technology and keeping our edge over China, staying ahead of them. And so we have to control this technology so it doesn't wind up into the, into the Chinese military. Okay. Is there anything that you anticipated my next question, which was, what do we need to do as a, as a Congress to ensure that we continue to be on the leading edge of this fight? Yeah, what I just said is that's it. You know, support the budget submission. BIS, once upon a time, wasn't necessarily as important as it might be today. Today, when you think about Chinese military capacity, you think about artificial intelligence, satellites, quantum, data, that's all tech, where America leads. So if you want us to protect that fully and vigorously and enforce that, we do need more resources, more people, and more technical capacity, technical people who work with us. Thank you, I yield back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to recognize the uh, gentleman from Florida, Mr. Frost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Neo City is a new and growing 500-acre tech campus just south of my district that is applied to be uh, one of the Chips and Science Act's regional technology and innovation hubs. It's a really beautiful project. I really encourage people to check it out. It shows how local government can really think big. Neo City includes Skywater Technology, a chip pa uh, packaging facility set to quadruple its workforce in the next two years, and workforce development programs through Neo City Academy High School and two colleges in my district, Valencia College and the University of Central Florida. Uh, Madam Secretary, when selecting regional hubs, how is the Department of Commerce's uh, Economic Development Administration taking into consideration local education and workforce development capacity, especially when the U.S. semiconductor industry has a worker shortage that can be filled by locally grown talent? Yes, thank you, Congressman. I'm not familiar with that particular application. I will go learn about it. But it sounds like exactly the kind of thing we're trying to incentivize, which is what you said bring in the high schools, bring in the community colleges, bring in the research universities, bring in the big companies like Skywater, and focus on an area of technology where you can go from excellent to world class. I do want to make that point, especially since Tech Hubs is so competitive. We're not trying to f invest in places. This is a national security program. Mm -hmm. We want to advance the frontier of technology. So we're not going to go for places that, um, that are distressed or that are you know, pr pretty good on the yeah. technology. We want to go for places that are 
excellent on the technology, make a big investment where they can be world leading in that technology. But anyway, the workforce piece of it, in some ways, is it's the whole game. You need the yeah. people to work. So it'll be uh, the, the merit-based process, the criteria leans heavily on the workforce component. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and definitely suggest checking out Neo City. Um, I got to visit the the campus. It's it's a huge project that'll include housing companies. The school mm -hmm. is right next to um, one of the companies where students get to go over there and learn about it. It's really, I think, going to provide a good model for how we can um, grow local talent. The massive investments of President Biden's Chips and Science Act will set the tone for what the domestic semiconductor industry looks like for years to come. Um, and so we have the opportunity now to create an industry that prioritizes worker safety and well-being. Um, we've had some great conversations with the AFL-CIO. It seems like companies are saying new jobs won't necessarily be union jobs. And um, there's a want for uh, substant uh, uh, substantial ongoing collaboration with unions, the Commerce Department, and these companies to ensure labor standards are enforced. What steps um, has Commerce taken to prevent a race to the bottom um, in terms of, of labor um, and the fact that uh, you know there's competition with overseas uh, semiconductor manufacturers? Yeah. So, uh, as I said, we are, you know, we're never going to mandate to a company. Um, there's D Davis Bacon's in the statute for the building of the facility, but these companies are going to have to make their own decisions with respect to the workers in the facility. That being said, uh, this administration cares deeply about high, st high labor standards and workplace conditions, safety, and wages. So we're having every company that's apply to give us their workforce plan, and we're gonna work on that with them to make sure that they have you know, high quality, uh, well compensated workforce to do the job. I, I see that as a taxpayer protection. Um, they need a workforce who can you know, get the job done. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, now, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Strong. Thank you, Chairman Babbitt and Secretary Raimondo for your time today. Secretary, your, your department works to ensure U.S. leadership in critical technologies such as artificial intel, uh, intelligence. This leadership depends on um, the, the nation's ability to bring advanced packaging on shore. Advanced packaging combines the fastest uh, logic chips, specifically GPUs and high bandwidth memory chips and certain design configurations, allowing the optional language training and inference techni uh, techniques uh, at the heart of AI. Do you have a good sense of which um, applicants or types of applicants best meet the advanced packaging needs? We do, we do. As I said, we've had 400 um, statements of interest, some including leading edge packaging, and it is part of our strategy to incentivize uh, packaging, because we want to have at least a couple of leading edge packaging investments in the U.S. as a result of this. Since there's virtually no packaging done in the U.S., do you feel confident in uh, the discussions with these few companies that work on advanced packaging that you can strike a deal and bring these technologies to the U.S.? I do. In August, the Commerce Department announced that in uh, the, uh, the year since the CHIPS Act was signed into law that the CHIPS Program Office has received more than 460 statements of interest for projects in 42 states. Uh, over August recess, I had the opportunity to visit with uh, large chemical manufacturers in North Alabama who are exploring expansion to support new semiconductor manufacturing because of the CHIPS Act. While significant attention has been given to large fabrication projects announced in states such as California, Arizona, New York, and Ohio, is it important that project, uh, it's important that projects in states like Alabama, where there is currently no significant presence of chip manufacturers, uh, are given fair consideration? Can you specifically describe the CHIPS program office's efforts so far to ensure that the CHIPS Act is implemented uh, as a national program with opportunities for states like mine that also want to play a critical role in the domestic semiconductor supply chain? Yes, I can absolutely assure you of that. Listen, this is completely merit-based. There are no states or projects that have any advantages over any other. It's based upon who can help us hit our 
uh, the mission of the program, which we've identified in a paper which we put out earlier this year. I'll say, of the $39 billion, we've said that $10 billion will be invested in uh, mature node chips and also supply chain companies, which would include chemical companies like the one you're talking about. So we would encourage them to apply, and I promise you they'll get a you know, really hard look. Thank you, Secretary. North Alabama is, um, is home to a variety of space-based technology research and development companies, as well as NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Both commercial, um, commercial companies and civil space organizations recognize the potential of utilizing microgravity as an environment uh, to make small, uh, smaller chips. Can you speak to the Department of uh, Commerce's interest in ensuring that the regulations uh, implementing the CHIPS Act directly acknowledges and supports the future of this important work in space? Uh, yes, it's a component. You know, although it sounds crazy to say that $39 billion is not enough money, it, you know, we can't do everything, and these are massive projects. So I can assure you we are looking to do the most cutting-edge work, including with AI chips and space-related chips to advance our national security goals, and that we'll look at all applications you know, very seriously. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I'd like to recognize uh, the uh, gentlewoman from Colorado, uh, Ms. Carvale. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, uh, Secretary Raimondo, for coming in to speak with us. Um, you know, I, I think I would re be remiss if I didn't mention Colorado's bid to be um, a tech hub and look forward to, to following that uh, process moving forward with you. Uh, now, one of the best things about Colorado is the concentration of research universities we have that are primed to take advantage of the benefits of the Chips and Science Act. These include um, universities like CU Boulder, Colorado State, and MSU Denver, which uh, Deputy Secretary Graves visited earlier this year. And while I'm eager uh, to make sure that these institutions um, are, are able to take advantage of the various programs in the CHIPS Act, um, uh, specifically CHIPS R&D and workforce programs, I also want to make sure that other institutions that maybe don't have the clout or the name recognition of a University of Colorado at Boulder are able to use these programs as well. Uh, my district is home to the University of Northern Colorado, which is a smaller public in institution that's becoming an attractive attractive um, option for many Coloradans. It's RUNC, perhaps lesser known than the North Carolina one, but um, it has seen a growing demand for undergraduate students to add more degrees into the STEM fields and is offering computer science and statistics uh, for the first time this uh, semester as a major. Uh, it, uh, many um, uh, more students are interested in mathematical science, um, sciences, and the university, I think, has been forward-thinking in, um, in expanding its expertise there. But I want to make sure that even though UNC is still growing, um, that they can compete with larger universities for new R&D and workforce programs being stood up by the department. So how is the department ensuring the smaller institutions that are still building their STEM programs like UNC will be able to engage in partnerships under the various CHIPS R&D and workforce programs? Yes, thank you. Let me be really clear about this. We won't succeed unless we have community colleges, all college, not just the tier one research universities. In some ways, you know, a lot of them are already doing their thing. We talked about Purdue earlier. We are completely focused on what you're talking about, especially when you have a college or a community college like that hooked into a, a bigger network of a statewide system. We need to be operating at every level. You know, I said earlier, there's a massive shortage of semiconductor technicians. There's a massive shortage of cybersecurity technicians, of digital backbone workers. You know, every one that that college can put out, we can put to work. So, and by the way, I, I lived this as governor. You know, when I was the governor of Rhode Island, we completely redid our community college and our non-research university four-year to granting university to be focused on the industry needs, and it, and it works. These students, um, in my experience, are incredibly hungry, hardworking, and they're the ones you need to support to get good jobs. So it's what we're doing. I mean, we are reaching out. We already have, I think, 50 community colleges around the country that we're kind of working with or who have, a, who have said they want to work with us to do what you said, like redesign the curriculum to match the needs. It's why we're asking companies 
to give us their workforce plan, and then we're going to work with them to say, have you thought about this college? What are you doing with this university? What do, you know, so we're, the NSTC is going to have a big workforce component, uh, a semiconductor workforce component, which will work with these universities. The NSF has a couple hundred million dollars for workforce. So across all of the R&D programs, there's a lot of workforce, and I just, I promise you we're going to go over out of our way to make sure it's inclusive. That being said, you just put that on my radar, so I'll make sure you know we focus in uh, in Colorado. Perfect. I appreciate the concentration on <clears throat> excuse me these smaller institutions, and in particular that you're reaching out to make sure that they know about the resources um, that you have. Um, and with that, my time has expired. Uh, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to uh, recognize Mr. Williams, the gentleman from New York. Madam Secretary. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, it's nice to meet you, and nice meet thank you for being here. Um, before we get started, I spent four months in Rhode Island in 1991 at Officer Candidate School, and so if you'll indulge me, um, do you know how long the Newport Bridge is? <laughs> you, you really don't have to answer that. Um, so. I don't, although I just kayaked under it in the Save the Bay swim. Yeah, the Narragansett's beautiful, but I can tell you that it's 16 long, long weeks long, sir. That's how long it is. <laughs> corresponding to my time there. I'm proud to represent the heart of the Silicon Empire, which is central New York. And as you know, Micron has uh, announced a $100 billion investment, uh, one of the largest in American history, to be part of this uh, resurgence of chip manufacturing in the United States. We have a fantastic application for the Regional Technology and Innovation Hub from western New York into central New York. And this is just Think of it as the superhighway for uh, the Silicon Empire. And we are also, in my district, home to some of our nation's most advanced weapon systems. And these are systems that require secure, reliable, and domestically produced silicon chips. So thank you for all you're doing and all those efforts. Um, I come out of the tech industry. The, uh, the new digital economy is increasing data creation at an exponential rate. And that's not hyperbole. Uh, industries like transportation, power generation, process manufacturing, and even the retail shopping experience are increasingly data driven. So solutions like artificial intelligence and self-driving cars need and create enormous amounts of data to be useful. And so I wanna highlight the tremendous risk our nation faces that the production of memory chips is dangerously concentrated in Asia. May I invite your comments on how the CHIPS program office is planning to ensure domestic production of memory chips, specifically, to protect the United States from relying solely on overseas production? Yes. So we do have memory as a focus of our investment program. We, we need, we've, we've put out in our paper, we want to have at least two clusters of leading edge logic, as well as advanced packaging, as well as memory, exactly as you said. You know, it's, it's not made in America now, uh, and we need to change that. One of the perceptions um, in, I, I think, for the layperson uh, is often focused on the logic portion uh, of, uh, you know, of silicon chips. We, we think about these advanced processors. Um, but in this data-driven world, the ability to write into and out of quickly to store vast amounts of storage, as we all know, on our phones, um, you know, is increasingly sort of taking over um, the helm of, uh, uh, of chips and a central focus of chips. Um, are there any positive developments in memory chip manufacturing that you're aware of that you would draw attention to, um, you know, beyond the, uh, the announcement, for example, of Micron? Is there any other action or activity going on in memory chip in the United States running through your office? Uh, that's the primary one. I mean, as you, you well know, there's only really three, there's two Korean companies, Samsung and Hynix, and then right. Micron. Uh, and we are interested, and right now, as you say, there's no really like most advanced memory made in America, which is something that we need to, you know, remedy through investing in this initiative program. And urgently, at, and at scale, I might add. And at scale. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Great. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I yield back. 
Uh, thank you, and now I'd like to uh, recognize the gentlewoman from uh, Pennsylvania, Ms. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Secretary Raimundo, for honoring this committee's invitation to be here today. Morning. Um, I'm proud that the EDA has a robust and positive working relationship with the Southwestern Pennsylvania Commission. I commend EDA's uh, commitment to equity as a top priority in their grants and programs as the administration encourages its grantees throughout the country to develop initiatives that present new ideas and creative approaches, approaches to advance economic prosperity in distressed communities. Um, NIST has been vital in advancing U.S. innovation and competitiveness. As someone who likes cold hard facts, NIST works directly. Uh, NIST's work directly impacts the daily lives of citizens to improve not only physical uh, tangibles like products, services, and infrastructures, but also improve our quality of life and standard of living. As a proud representative of uh, Western Pennsylvania, my constituents expect us to address their concerns on the implications AI will have on our labor and our workforce. AI presents um, fascinating opportunities in STEM and advanced manufacturing. But we also need to exercise caution to ensure that we provide access to opportunity for skills training and education to every worker, and that we're truly uh, understanding the ethical implications involved and the concerns regarding bias and discrimination. Investments in our future through legislation like the CHIPS and Science Act will only continue uh, to foster more success stories like those in my district and across the country through the work that's done through NIST, uh, but this work does change lives. Um, Secretary Raimundo, how is the Department of Commerce collaborating with other agencies to ensure that domestic content uh, requirements for tax credit, uh, excuse me, tax credit incentives in, uh, in industries like steel manufacturing ensure American competitiveness and robust business opportunities for small and mid-sized enterprises? Um, sorry, just sorry. Can you first of all, it's nice to meet you. Just say yeah. the last. I was with you on the AI, and then I. Yeah, we left there. Um, <laughs> just sorry. Just yeah, no, no. Question. You've been here for a long time, I and have. it's freezing I in here. It I, freezing. My question is, is about how uh, Department of Commerce is collaborating with other agencies uh, to ensure that domestic content requirements for tax credit incentives industries like steel manufacturing um, ensure American competitive and ro uh, competitiveness and robust business opportunities for small and mid sized Company. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, we are re really serious about enforcing all of that. Um, at, I mean, you know better than most that Chinese dumping of cheap steel into the market has hurt a lot of people, including in your district. And so we have um, Buy America provisions and uh, U.S. content requirements that uh, wherever they are uh, in statute, we enforce them. Also, on the other side of our house, in the Commerce Department, we also, you know, maintain tariffs and countervailing duties wherever we need to, so we have a vibrant domestic steel industry. Uh, you can't be a strong country without making steel. Thank you. And I was going to ask you about Western Pennsylvania's uh, ecosystem for robotics and uh, our autonomy sector, but uh, a lot of folks have been able to actually ask questions about what I was going to say there, so I didn't want to uh, overwhelm you with repetitive questions. Um, but for my final question, with the development and expansion of the domestic production of semiconductors and other advanced technologies, how is your agency working to continually update the NIST artificial intelligence risk management framework to ensure workforce development initiatives are effective in supporting labor but not supplanting labor? Yes, exactly. Exactly what you just said. Working with NIST, but also the White House has been you know, working across the interagency to put out other frameworks on the topic you just said, which is how do we deal with the fact that AI is going to change the way we all work and we have to be there for all workers. It, 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 you know, certain jobs will change, but we have to use AI to create jobs, not um, destroy jobs. For people's jobs will change, but we have to make sure that they are retrained to do different jobs and not left out. Yeah, I, th I thank you uh, for the consideration that the agency will will, will put into AI and, and, and workforce as people, you know, people with disabilities, people who have various concerns will find increasing access um, to a quality of life, but we do want to make sure that we're prioritizing workers. I uh, My time is done, and I uh, yield back. Thank, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Miller. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Madam Secretary. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for your patience. Uh, I know it's been a good bit. You spoke earlier, and you've been ongoingly talk about the importance of increasing opportunities for career and technical education. I could not agree more, uh, so I'm going to dive right in and forgo my monologue. Uh, what is the Commerce doing to ensure that CHIPS funding goes to projects that will actually create jobs for Americans? And do you believe that the American workforce has the ability to compete co to complete these construction projects and then has the engineers and technicians needed to operate these new fabs here in the country? I do, but we have a lot of work to do. So I have a team on the CHIPS team who, who are helping figure out the construction workforce plans with each of the applicants. You know, so Ohio, like these facilities will require five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand people to build. The unemployment rate in the building trades right now, no matter where you live, is like zero, two yeah. percent. So we need new apprenticeship programs. We need to recruit people in high school. We need girls and women to do these jobs. And y will we do it? Yes, but I can't sugarcoat it. It's a lot of work. Same thing for in the fabs. Um, I, we are pushing the companies, governors, mayors, educational institutions, ch update your curriculum, teach people what's relevant so they can get these jobs. Yeah, I mean, even in the state of Ohio right now, and as you know, the Intel project is coming to Columbus, which is just a couple hours south of the 7th District, but we're around 2,000 carpenters short right now yeah. for that project in Intel. And as you just said, with the 2% dip in the trades, amongst the whole. Now, I love what you said about encouraging uh, our educational system to promote more of the trades, K through 12, technical education and STEM workforce, uh, and, I, and I applaud you for that. I just would really like to see it come from the state and local level and see yes. more of an influx there throughout our entire country than doing what's easiest here, uh, which is just more federal legislation that nobody needs, uh, in my opinion, but I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. Can I say one thing on sure. that? Um, as part of the, the incentive program, the CHIPS money we're putting out, we are requiring the applicant to come to us with money from the state, including workforce. So we're putting the burden on the company, say Intel in your case, for example, yeah. would go to Ohio or go to Columbus and find out what incentives, including workforce or apprenticeship programs, whatever, put it in the application before they apply to us. We're trying to draw forward all that at the local level. I also started an initiative called A Million Women in Construction, there's about a million women right now in America that work in construction. We got to try to double it. I mean, awesome. I just met with the group actually right before here uh, about women in construction. You know, I have a few questions here, but I'm, I'm just going to ask: What do you think uh, when it comes to the technical education, the drawback that we're seeing amongst the trades? Do you attribute to work ethic? Do you attribute it to societal norms within this country changing? I mean, you've talked about innovation. Uh, you know, we've shipped off you know, uh, ma manufacturing to focus on innovation within this country, and we've lost out on that, so we don't have parity. I mean, where do you think it is? Because in Cleveland, Ohio, you know, our steel workers, it's hot in the summer, and it's very cold in the winter. And it is tough work, but what I can yes. tell you is they're yes. getting paid $120,000 a yes. year right now with full pensions, and they will be millionaires, and our kids that are going to school will be half a million in debt. So uh, just curious what your totally response agree. is. Totally agree. You know, I think it's a lot of things. We can maybe follow up when we have more than a minute. Uh, I do think the cultural norms, I think like pushing everybody to college isn't necessarily the right move. And most, like 40% of American kids who go to college drop out, so they have loans, no degree, and it's not a good path. So I've, even when I was governor, I'm a big believer in vocational training, technical skills, apprenticeships. Girls should think of themselves as a plumber or as a welder. They can do these jobs. You know, the average entry level, like um, certified nurse assistant or home health care, which is heavily women, is like maybe like $15 an hour. And those are tough jobs too. The average plumber, apprentice, maybe 40 bucks an hour, on your way to 80 bucks an hour. So I think we have to start to say these are good jobs. They're good jobs for America. You, you know, not everybody has to be a PhD engineer or whatever. Go do these jobs, build the future of America, and make a good living. I could not agree more. Uh, I'd love to follow up with you later on. Chairman, my time has ended. I yield back. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And now I recognize the gentleman from uh, California, Mr. Liu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Secretary Romano, for your leadership. I'd like to ask you some questions about artificial intelligence. Uh, AI has been a driver of our economy and will continue to be a driver of our economy. Last year, with the public release of large language models, individuals and companies now have 
access to very expensive AI technology at their fingertips. Mm. Largely, that's going to benefit society. It can also cause harm because some of these individuals would be terrorists or criminals. Just a few minutes ago, I went on ChatGPT and simply typed in, how can I build a lethal virus? And it said, I'm very sorry, but I can't assist with that. And then I asked, how do I build a dirty nuclear bomb? Same answer, I can't assist with that. And that's because ChatGPT is a closed AI system, and their programmers put in guardrails, so it doesn't answer those questions. Open source, large language models, you can have the guardrails removed pretty easily. I want to know if you or the Department of Commerce have a, has a view on whether there should be some regulations on open source AI large language models above a certain size. Yeah. Um, I, let, me, let me say this and then answer your question directly. Um, I agree. AI has incredible potential, which is incredibly exciting, especially in healthcare, if you think about you know, finding cures to diseases more quickly. But the downside is just as scary, and that's why um, the White House is, has convened companies to take on voluntary commitments. I think we need to do that as a bridge to this body, Congress, enacting regulations. But yes, we have to, uh, we have to think about the threats of open models and come up with a regulatory environment as well because as I understand it, and you know more than I do, the open models are only like a generation behind the largest frontier large language models, which is to say they're pretty powerful. And so we do need to find ways to regulate and protect the downside for the open models. Thank you. NIST has done incredible work, and they have put out a AI risk management framework that's gotten good reviews from both the public sector and private sector. Part of it is simply having organizations think through the issues raised by AI and have a process for working through those issues. Earlier this year, con uh, Congress members Zoe Lofgren, Haley Stevens, and I wrote a letter to the president asking him to apply the NIST risk management framework to the entire federal executive branch. So I'd like for you to request and consider applying the NIST risk management framework to the Department of Commerce. And if you would look into that, that'd be greatly appreciated. Okay, I will. And then uh, lastly, I want to follow up on your comment uh, that it was not such a great idea to push everyone into four-year colleges. And I think that if you look across our economy, there is a huge shortage of skilled workers in the trades. And so I support your efforts in that regard. Anything I can do to uh, help incentivize having more people in the trades, uh, I would like to help you with that. Thank uh, you. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Kasson from Illinois. Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, nice to see you today. Um, the, uh, I, I want to chat a little bit. Um, as you know, when we were debating the, what became the Chips and Science Act, we were, our office was, was concerned about, with this huge amount of money, thankfully, that we're putting in, how do we make sure that those taxpayer money, that ta taxpayer money is not going to shareholders through buyback programs, and how do we put those protections in place? And um, ultimately, we, we weren't successful in getting the strong language we wanted in there. There's some weaker language in the bill, and such as the legislative process. Uh, but um, as a result of that, we, we had led a letter last February to Michael Schmidt in your office asking basically what could we do administratively to put those stronger protections in. Um, grateful for a lot of the back and forth we had with your office afterwards, um, in addition to some of the statements that your office and you personally have made about giving preference to companies that are not going to um, engage in buybacks. Um, having said all that, I'm a, I'm a little bit concerned about your exchange at the start of this hearing with Mr. Babin saying that if a company, that that would not be a prerequisite for, for funding if a company didn't make those commitments. And so, to, to my mind, if, if that's not a prerequisite, that raises the possibility that we may find ourselves in a situation giving money through chips to a company that doesn't need the money, essentially displacing private capital, and creating a what we were concerned about two years ago, that, that tra wealth transfers from taxpayers to shareholders. And so, so I guess my first question for you is when you say that you will be giving preference, 
Can you explain mechanically what that means? Um, is this just a nice to have? How are you actually prioritizing when you make these investments? Yeah. So as you well know, the statute says our money cannot be used for buybacks. Um, so we're going to do everything we can to uh, invest the money in accordance with the statute. What I was saying earlier, I think the question was a version of can you guarantee you won't give money to a company that does buybacks? And the answer to that is no, we may. Uh, but we have a very rigorous system. We're, th this, there's like a lot of back and forth with these companies. They apply and we have you know, months or weeks of discussion. They need to show us, show us their books, show us the financial plan, show us how much they're investing in research and development, and prove to us that they actually need our money to do whatever it is you know, that they're doing. So I think of it as like a balance. My number one job is to hit the national security goals, also to, to protect taxpayer money, not use any, you know, get a good deal, not use any, not give any company a dollar more than they need to to hit the mission. Um, and obviously, most important, like to, to do what the statute says. So it is true that we uh, have a preference for companies that won't do buybacks mostly because we need them to put every single penny they have into their workforce, into innovation, into R&D. But I can't promise you that a company that, do, that does in their, you know, in their business do buybacks or has in the past done buybacks won't receive an incentive grant if we think the business they're in is necessary for our national security and they can't be successful in doing that without an incentive. What, what enforcement do you have if you, you, you do all that, they make the voluntary pledge, and then two years from now, they violate the pledge? Do, yeah, you, have, do you have clawback provisions you're putting in? Like legally, can you, do you have recourse back to that taxpayer money? Yeah, thank you for asking that because I should have said it before. Um, all of these grants will be sent out in tranches. So let's say XYZ company receives a $2 billion grant. We're not gonna wire them $2 billion there is subject to an investment plan. So you can you know, get X amount, hit these milestones, get Y amount. If at any point along the way they break any of the conditions, e either, depending on what they do, we can claw back money, or they don't get the next installation. OK. Um, I'm out of time, but uh, would welcome to continue the conversation and yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from California is not recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for your testimony and your leadership. My uh, district in the San Francisco Bay Area is a hub of the innovation economy, so lots of folks are interested in how chips and science uh, is rolling out. Uh, in July, the uh, Semiconductor Industry Association released a study that projected the shortfall of 67,000 workers in the semiconductor industry by 2030. Uh, as you know, to address this challenge, Chips and Science Act authorized a number of workforce development programs uh, scattered throughout the CHIPS office, uh, R&D programs and incentives uh, programs. I am a, uh, a veteran of our California Workforce Development Board, at, as well as our local Workforce Investment Board in San Mateo County. So uh, my, my question is, how uh, is the department's overall strategy uh, enabling the semiconductor workforce uh, through these programs, how that uh, coordination is happening uh, with uh, the existing federal workforce funding streams, but also is there coordination going on with the state uh, workforce development boards and, and state and local uh, workforce boards? How is all of that being uh, integrated, if it is? It is. The way we're endeavoring to do that coordination is Every company who applies for money or receives money has to give us a workforce plan that we approve after extensive back and forth. And in that plan is what is the state doing, what's the city doing, what's commerce doing, but then also, um, you know, like, as I said before, the NSF. So we're trying to have a plan in place for every, you know, company's proposal. And, uh, just, uh, I also have a workforce team, I should say. I've built a workforce team at the CHIPS, at the chips office in commerce. Um, so I, just to give you a sense, like we are really serious about the workforce component and, and providing technical assistance where we can so that everyone has a really fulsome workforce plan. 
Great. And my uh, district has uh, over 600 life science companies, so I just wanted to ask you uh, about uh, how NIST uh, collaborates with other agencies, such as the FDA, uh, for example, to create frameworks and standards that ensure biotech products uh, go through the regulatory process in an efficient way. Um, what kind of coordination is happening uh, through your department and other entities like the FDA, for example? Exactly what you say. I think NIST is, um, I give so much credit to them because they are like neutral science-based place that works with industry but also other agencies. And I know biotech is one of the top priorities. Thank you for your leadership. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from New York is now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the chair and ranking member for holding this important hearing, and Secretary Raimondo uh, for your leadership at the uh, Department of Commerce. Um, New York State, and especially the capital region, the district that I represent, have uh, been a pioneer in computing design, development, and manufacturing for nearly 80 years. Today, New York State is home to the world's most advanced microelectronic breakthroughs, including the foundational chip innovations that enable today's um, AI systems and the world's most powerful AR supercomputer. Our existing infrastructure paired with the deep bench of know-how means that New York is ready to become the linchpin for national efforts to coordinate NSTC activities aimed at alleviating the chip shortage and propelling sustainable R&D. I understand the selection committee will soon announce the Board of Trustees for the new nonprofit entity that will construct the NSTC. So, um, Madam Secretary, can you outline a timeline for the announcement of the board and next steps they will take uh, once impaneled? Yes. Um, so, the, in the next you know, couple of months, I think we'll have announcements about the board. Their first thing that they would do would be to announce uh, the CEO of the NSTC, which also should all happen this fall. And then there will be a process to actually establish the NSTC uh, ne you know, early next year. And the decisions around how many locations, uh, et cetera, will all be made you know, at that time. Uh, and can you provide insight on the governance structure that the NSTC uh, will use to operate? So they will have a board. We have a selection committee now that's going to put an initial board in place. That, that initial board will choose a CEO and then other board members. And then NIT, our Department of Commerce will have a um, agreement with NIST, a research agreement, which similar to what NIST has done for a long time with other entities, which will lay out uh, you know, how they intend to use the federal money to execute their vision. Thank you. And once the board is selected, how does the department intend to ensure that public-private partnerships drive solutions to the NSTC's grand challenges? Uh, so the whole thing is a public-private partnership. As per statute, it's a, it's a consortia. We are uh, we're committed to making this be a, a purpose-built, you know, science-based, neutral um, effort. And as I said, there'll be a research agreement as between NIST and the NSTC, which will lay all of that out, and, and we will hold them accountable to what is in that agreement. Thank you. And there was a white paper on the NAPMP that was supposed to be issued and has been delayed. Can you share any new or additional information on the timing and scope of, uh, of the entity? Um, I just looked at one of my associates because the, it's coming very soon this fall. I was hoping he was going to say maybe next week, but I guess um, we'll stay on it. <laughs> okay, so we'll go with this fall. fall. Yeah. Okay. I have several academic institutions in my district that will be critical to educating and training the workforce needed to support industry demands as well as conducting the advanced research for the next generation of chip technology. Mm -hmm. Can you provide insight into the department's work across federal agencies to ensure that co collaboration with universities um, will incubate that uh, research and science? That is, that's exactly the plan. You know, we're working with the NSF. We're actually working very well with the DOD uh, across agencies to uh, work with universities. The vision would be that the universities 
we, we, look, someone asked me earlier what success looked like in five years. In five years, it's this seamless back and forth between industry, startups, and universities. So we get the inventions coming out of universities out of the lab and into products we make in America. Okay. Well, again, I thank you for your responses. I thank you for your leadership. And uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes himself for four minutes. Um, Madam Secretary, I, I thank you for your time. Um, I may go over some stuff you've already talked about. I'm not sure, but man, they keep us bouncing around around here. Um, I'm also chair of the uh, subcommittee for research and technology. So we talk about uh, anything from semiconductors, AI, hypersonics, even did a, a round table on quantum technology. And I kind of want to ask about your trip to China because China has stated that by 2045, they want to be not only just the economic leader, but militarily, socially, um, even in space. And, and from what we're gathering, a lot of it, they're ahead of us. Um, you take quantum technology, I think they spend more than the entire world on developing that. So I'd, I'd like to know what you may have found out, if, if any of that, if there's any subs if there's any evidence of that, they're ahead of us, behind us, beside us, uh, on what you learned there in China. Yeah. So, look, I'm as concerned as you are that we can't let them get ahead, and we certainly can't let them get any of our technology to do things that could hurt us. Uh, you know, I, th I think that with respect to AI, the U.S. leads the world, and we need to stay there. I also know that, as you say, the Chinese government is putting hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars into these technologies with the express goal of dominating. So when I was there, I was clear that we don't negotiate when it comes to national security. We don't compromise. Um, and I was clear that we're not going to make any changes to, for example, our export controls, which is what I am, work on. Um, we're going to continue to vigorously control U.S. technology so they cannot get this technology for their military. And I also was clear that as long as they have this military-civil fusion strategy, where really everything is the military, and they can go into any company and take technology and use it for the military, that means we're going to have to be tougher than ever to control that technology from getting into the hands of their military. It's not that we want to you know, hold back their economy, per se, but we do want to hold back their military, and I was very clear in saying that. Yeah, well, I, I, I think we should hold back their economy, too. I'm very much America first, which I guess kind of leads me into my next question. I also sit on natural resources. So we have been all over the country talking about critical minerals and the fact that we're down to three smelters, China, processes 80% of our critical minerals here in from where what we provide. And um, as far as Taiwan and semiconductors, we know that China even threatened to withhold critical minerals from them. And, and, I, and I heard you the few minutes I was in here earlier, you were talking about making sure that we bring semiconductors home, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. But we have, in this administration, has really made a concerted effort and it's been several administrations to not allow people to mine here in the states. And, and I don't understand how you can um, advocate semiconductors here in this country when China's already shown that they're willing to withhold critical minerals and we're not willing to mine critical minerals here in our own country. So uh, I can't speak to what's been done in the past, but I, 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 I do think you're right. You're right. We are dependent on them and we have to do everything we can to either you know, mine here or on allied shores. Um, and for my part of it, you know, I'm gonna do what I need to do with export controls to hold them back. But when I think about chips, the chip's just one piece of it. It's the raw materials, it's the rare earths, the critical minerals, and we do need a holistic strategy on that. Right, right. All right, well, I am out of time, I thank you. Um, I want to thank the Secretary for joining us today and the members for their questions. The record will remain open for 10 days for additional comments and written questions from members. Uh, this hearing is 